R. E. Lee, A Biography, Volume 2, Chapters 18 through 23. Written by Douglas Southall Freeman. Published by Charles Scribner's Sons, New York and London, 1934. Digitalization by Bill Thayer. Audiobook produced by Open Audio Recordings and read by Nancy, a Microsoft Azure AI neural voice. Chapter 18, The Federal Army Should Have Been Destroyed. A heavy mist as wet as rain hung over the battlefield when July 2 dawned. From the Confederate side, it was impossible to tell whether the enemy still held Malvern Hill or had retired. Lee's brigades were still hopelessly confused. Commanders did not know where their men were, men could not find their officers. As it grew lighter, three thin regiments of Early's brigade were visible near the center in the open field. To their right lay not more than a dozen weary men, Armistead among them. A little farther around the Crewhouse Hill, with their faces still toward the enemy, were the remnants of Wright's and Mahone's brigades, stoutly holding the ground they had won under the muzzles of the Federal guns. Elsewhere, over the field of the charge, the only victims of the slaughter were to be seen amid the debris of the battle. A third of them were dead, attested a federal officer who stood not far away, but enough were alive and moving to give the field a singular crawling effect. The different stages of the ebbing tide are often marked by the lines of flotsam and jetsam left along the seashore. So here could be seen three distinct lines, marking the last front of three Confederate charges of the night before. On the crest of the hill a mixed federal force of cavalry and infantry was waiting. It made a show of advance, but drew back at the first fire of scattered Confederates. A few score of Huger's men came up about this time and at Early's instance reported to Armistead. From the woods the ambulance details began to trickle slowly out, officers rode forward, soon an informal truce prevailed and thousands of hungry, restless men emerged from the woods to search for missing comrades or to look for food in the haversacks of the fallen. Shattered bodies were everywhere and dead men in every contortion of their last agony. Weapons and the keepsakes of soldiers, caps and knapsacks, playing cards and pocket testaments, bloody heads with bulging eyes, booted legs, severed arms with hands gripped tight, torsos with the limbs blown away, grey coats dyed black with boys' blood, it was a nightmare of hell, set on a firm, green field of reality, under a workaday, leaden, summer sky, a scene to sicken the simple. Home-loving soldiers who had to fight the war while the politicians responsible for bringing a nation to. Madness stood in the streets of safe cities and mouthed wrathful platitudes about constitutional rights. Toward ten o'clock, after the mist had turned into a cold and drenching rain, the last of the Federals disappeared. At the Poindexter house, where he probably had spent the night, Lee received reports. Once again, he had to ask the question, where had McClellan Beta Ken himself? An immediate federal offensive against Richmond could of course be left out of consideration inasmuch as the Federals were in retreat. Eliminating that, there were three possibilities, the enemy might be nearby, preparing to refit and again offer battle, he might be retiring farther down the river to take ship and renew the struggle on some other front, or, lastly, he might be about to pass over the James, as he had crossed the Chickahominy, unite with Burnside's army from North Carolina capture Drury's bluff and open the way for his men of war to reach Richmond. There had been some disquieting and rather mysterious activity on the James during the battles of the Seven Days. The War Department was concerned, especially as Drury's had been almost stripped of men when Holmes had been moved to the north side of the James. Canvassing these possibilities, Lee determined, one, to send the cavalry immediately in pursuit, two, to move a part of the army down the James to be at hand if the enemy proved aggressive, and, three, to return homes to Drury's Bluff at once. Orders were issued accordingly, and President Davis was so advised by letter. As Jackson was nearest the line of the federal retreat and had suffered least in the campaign, he was ordered to leave D.H. Hill's battered division at Malvern Hill and to move against the enemy with the rest of his force. Longstreet and A. P. Hill were to follow. The remaining units of the army were to remain for the time in their positions, burying the dead, caring for the wounded, and collecting arms and accoutrements from the field. The rain was falling very heavily by the time these orders were issued. Every officer who came to report was streaming. The downpour already was changing the bottomlands into a miry pond, miles wide. Jackson's men were ready but wet and had been directed to build fires, to cook, and to dry their clothing.
Longstreet, and A. P. Hill were preparing to make their way through the still disorganized forces on the Confederate center. The enemy also must be suffering. Persons in the neighborhood, whom Jackson had interviewed earlier in the morning, told him that the Federals were retreating down the river road in the greatest demoralization. He so reported to Lee when he called at the Poindexter's. Stewart's information was to the same effect. The opportunity seemed great if the endurance of the men sufficed and the deluge did not prevent pursuit. Jackson remained with Lee by the fire in the dining room of the plantation house until his men could take the road. Presently, Longstreet came in. Lee was dictating to Taylor at the moment, but he was interrupted by the newcomer. General, said Longstreet, brusquely, are you sending anyone to Richmond today? Yes, answered Lee, an orderly will set out soon, can we do anything for you? Yes, send Mrs. Longstreet word I am alive yet, she is up at Lynchburg. Lee was a little embarrassed, it did not accord with his ideas of the social amenities to have a message to the wife of a high officer telegraphed by an orderly. Oh, General Longstreet, he said in his most polished tones, will you not write yourself? Is it not due to your good lady after these tremendous events? Longstreet threw himself into a chair and dashed off a few lines, which he duly delivered. Lee resumed the conversation, General, has your morning's ride led you to see anything of the scene of awful struggle of the afternoon? Yes, General, I rode over pretty much all of the line of the fighting. What are your impressions? Lee inquired. I think you hurt them about as much as they hurt you. That was not to Lee's liking, equal losses were not gain. There was a bit of irony, almost a twang, in his voice as he replied, then I am glad we punished them well, at any rate. Longstreet was not cheerful, however, despite his claim. The weather and the condition of the troops both depressed him. After a while, he sloshed out in his wet garments. Lee was left with Jackson and a few officers of their staffs, pondering still the plan of pursuit. Soon another visitor came in, the president, attended by his brother, Colonel Joseph Davis. The chief executive had been scouring the country in an effort to find whiskey for the wet and exhausted men, and his coming was so unexpected that Lee forgot part of his usual address. President, he said, not Mr. President, I am delighted to see you. They shook hands, Davis looked about him, his glance rested on Jackson, whom he had never met. Stonewall bristled at the sight of the president because he considered Davis had been unjust to him in the controversy over the Romney expedition. All that Jackson did, after rising, was to stand stiffly at attention. Why, said Lee, President, don't you know General Jackson? This is our Stonewall Jackson. Davis saw that the general was not disposed to accept advances, so he merely bowed. Old Jack saluted and said nothing. Sitting down with the president at the table, Lee reviewed the military outlook. When Davis made what seemed to be an impracticable proposal, Lee listened courteously and then explained why it could not be carried out. To Jackson's staff officers, treated to this rare sight of a confidential discussion between the commander-in-chief and the commanding general of the army, it seemed that Lee had an easy ascendancy over the mind of Davis. As the two talked, the rain continued mercilessly, a heavier downpour than ever. The more the situation was considered, the more confused it appeared. At last Lee and Davis agreed that the weather and the uncertainty of the army made effective pursuit impracticable that day. Jackson sat silent as the reasons for this regrettable decision were canvassed, and when he was asked for his opinion, he only remarked quietly, they have not all got away if we go immediately after them. But his eyes were flashing and his military instincts were in rebellion. He believed that the enemy could and should be pursued, for his experience with a retreating enemy persuaded him that McClellan was beaten and not merely retiring for new maneuvers. Undoubtedly Jackson was right regarding the condition of the enemy, but insistence on a swift pursuit, in such weather, was the counsel of perfection. The Army of Northern Virginia, at the close of the action at Malvern Hill, was in the condition in which both it and the Army of the Potomac were to find themselves after nearly every major engagement of the next two years. The adversary put up so good a battle, winning or losing, that the opposing army was exhausted and incapable of pursuit. The margin of superiority was so narrow, on either side, that a victory could rarely be developed into a triumph. 
The best evidence that this was the case after Malvern Hill is the fact that Longstreet and A. P. Hill, who certainly could not be accused of slacking at any stage of the campaign, were able to make only two miles across the front through the storm of July 2. The rain ceased on the morning of July 3, and the pursuit began down the new Market River Road. It had hardly started before Lee learned from Stewart that the Federals had already reached Harrison's Landing, eight miles down the James from the Confederate position at Malvern Hill. The main road was muddy, horribly cut up, exposed for part of the way to possible fire from Federal gunboats in the James, and was said to have been obstructed by the enemy. From the north, the approach was so much better in every respect that Lee determined to change his line of advance, to avoid the new Market River Road as far as possible, and to carry his columns back up the Willis Church Road for a distance of two and a half miles. Jackson was in advance, with Longstreet following, but as Longstreet had consistently outmarched Jackson during the campaign, Lee ordered Jackson to halt and to give the road to Longstreet. Lee remained at the Poindexter House to await developments. Rumors were current that McClellan was preparing a great shift across the James, but Stewart's dispatches, arriving every few hours, indicated no such movement on the enemy's part. Lee's judgment was on the side of Stewart's observation. The misgivings he had felt on the 2D disappeared almost entirely, and he concluded that it was hardly possible for McClellan to effect a crossing and to organize a new advance on the south side of the James. However, as it was doubtful whether the whole of the army could be employed against McClellan in his new position, Lee decided to hold most of the troops of Huger, of Magruder, and of D. H. Hill at Malvern Hill, whence they could be moved easily down the James or, if needed, to the right bank of that stream. The reserve artillery was ordered back to positions nearer Richmond. It was useless where it was and could not be conveniently furnished with supplies. After reporting to the president on the state of affairs, Lee on July 3 made only one or two minor detachments of force. He dispatched a few troops to the vicinity of his mother's nearby girlhood home, Shirley, probably in answer to a message from Colonel T. R. R. Cobb of the Cavalry, who sent word that, if he were reinforced, he believed he could cut off the rear wagon train of the Federals. Unfortunately, the troops sent to support him did not establish contact with the cavalry. Another detachment was ordered in the same direction to collect the arms the Federals had discarded. Later in the afternoon, Stewart announced that he had held the high ground north of the Federal position until driven off about 2 p.m. by a superior force. He had hoped that Longstreet and Jackson would come up in time to occupy the position in force, but they had not arrived. Longstreet, as a matter of fact, had missed his road but he reached the front of the enemy before nightfall. Jackson, following Longstreet, could only cover three miles that day, proof enough that he was mistaken in his belief on the 2D that a rapid pursuit was practicable. Lee's first care on the morning of July 4 was to send D. R. Jones's division of Magruder's command down the river to Longstreet's support. This done, Lee rode forward to examine McClellan's position. He had not gone far before he received an urgent request from Longstreet to join him. On arrival he found part of the army drawn up in line of battle, a P. Hill on the right and Jackson in the center, with Longstreet in support. D. R. Jones, as his men came up, was taking position on the left. Longstreet, as senior division commander, had made these dispositions, with the intention of recovering the high ground, known as Evelington Heights, which Stuart had been forced to give up the previous day. The Federal skirmishers had been driven in, but Jackson had protested that his men were in no condition to attack and had requested that the advance be not ordered till Lee could be consulted. Lee was much disappointed to learn that no opportunity of striking the enemy had been found, and he proceeded at once and on foot to reconnoiter. The Federal's ground had been chosen with the same care that had been displayed in the selection of all McClellan's defensive positions during the campaign. Harrison's Landing was on a long, low promontory extending into the James River. On the west was a small stream known as Kimmage Creek. From a point about a mile east of this stream, Herring Creek meandered eastward for some three miles through a swamp and thence turned southward into the James. Opposite the low ground, along the two creeks, Federal gunboats lay in the river, with the batteries trained across the meadows. North of Herring Creek the river road ran from east to west across a ridge that dominated the fields where the Union troops were resting. This ridge was Evelington Heights, for the recovery of which Longstreet had prepared his line of battle.
Stewart had learned on the night of the 2D that the Federals had incautiously neglected to occupy the heights and strength, and on morning of the 3D he had seized them. Instead, however, of concealing his cavalry until the infantry arrived, he had boldly opened fire with the solitary howitzer attached to his command. This, of course, had given the alarm without inflicting any appreciable damage on the enemy. By two o'clock Stuart had been driven off. Federals had at once occupied the ridge. Lee now learned all the facts for the first time, and as he examined the ground he found the heights crowned with Union artillery and ample infantry support. In the light of reality, Stuart's message of the previous afternoon, announcing his evacuation of the position, took on an unhappy significance. The only opportunity of winning decisive victory after the Battle of Fraser's Farm had been thrown away for the pleasure of annoying the enemy with one howitzer. Longstreet was chafing to attack, Jackson's judgment was against it, Lee did not attempt a decision until he had thoroughly surveyed every line of approach. Finding at last that the federal position was protected on all sides, except for a narrow stretch on the northwest, he concluded most unwillingly that an offensive was not justified. As far as I can now see, he wrote the president, there is no way to attack, the enemy, to advantage, nor do I wish to expose the men to the destructive missiles of his gunboats. I fear he is too secure under cover of his boats to be driven from his position. This decision in reality marked the end of the campaign. Later reconnaissance confirmed Lee's judgment of the impracticability of an attack without heavy loss of life. Mr. Davis concurred in Lee's decision with much inward distress that a coup de grace could not be administered the foe, and on July 5 he issued a congratulatory order that was in itself a recognition that a further development of the Confederate success was not expected. The aftermath was brief. Lee organized an artillery expedition to bombard the Federal shipping from a point below Harrison's Landing, but achieved no large results. Signs multiplied that the enemy was being reinforced and was digging in at Harrison's Landing, apparently with the intention of remaining there until he decided upon some new plan of action. Lee established headquarters at the Phillips House, near Salem Church, about four miles north of Evelington Heights, and there awaited developments. More than once he was tempted to strike, but, as he told President Davis, in the present condition of our troops I did not think it proper to risk an attack on the results of which so much depended. If this was the case, nothing was to be gained by keeping the infantry huddled together in front of Harrison's Landing. They could rest and reorganize far more readily away from the strain of close contact with the enemy. On July 7, Lee published his order thanking the army for its service, the next day he prepared for the move, and on July 9, leaving the cavalry to watch McClellan, he put the columns on the march back toward camps near Richmond. His own headquarters were re-established at the Dabs House. The tangible results of the campaign were for every man's reckoning. The whole plan of federal operations in Virginia had been disrupted after its success had seemed inevitable. On June 26, McClellan's army of 105,000 effectives had been like a sharpened sickle, ready to sweep over Richmond. His outposts, five miles from the city, could see its highest spire. The farthest Union infantry had been less than eight miles from the capital itself. Now his diminished and disorganized army, with its equipment in chaos, was crowded into an entrenched camp 18 miles away. Fifty-two fine federal guns were in Confederate hands. Ten thousand prisoners had been captured, and upwards of thirty-one thousand needed small arms were gleaned from the fields. The siege of Richmond was raised, Lee reported, and the object of the campaign, which had been prosecuted after months of preparation at an enormous expenditure of men and money, completely frustrated. Yet too many Confederate dead were buried between Mechanicsville and Malvern Hill, and too many men lay wretched in the hospitals for Lee to feel any elation. Of the 85,000 men with whom he had opened the campaign, 3286 were dead, 15,909 were wounded, and 946 were missing, a total of 20,141. Half the wounded, roughly, were doomed to die or to be permanently incapacitated for field duty. In other words, 11,000 men, the first line of the South, had been lost to the Confederacy for all time. Some brigades had been reduced by half their strength. Ripley, for example, had seen 45 officers and 846 men sacrificed in a total of 2,366.
Those artillerists who had been able to get into action had been decimated. In Pegram's gallant battery, 60 of his 80 men were among the fallen. The loss of officers was staggering. The leading men in every community, the trained, the intelligent and the martial-minded, had been chosen to command in 1861, many of them had been re-elected in 1862. Recklessly charging at the head of their soldiers, they had been slain by scores. Many of those who were already displaying talent that would have made them brigade and division commanders in 18631864 died on the hills or in the swamps along the Chickahominy. The potential excellence of the field command of the Army of Northern Virginia was impaired in proportion. Federal losses were assumed to be higher, but actually they were less by nearly 4,300. The heavy casualties were not the only reason why Lee viewed the outcome of the campaign without any of the exhilaration of triumph. He had achieved less than he had hoped, less than he believed he should have accomplished. Under ordinary circumstances, he stated in his report, the Federal Army should have been destroyed. He did not write this until March, 1863, when some of the division commanders of the Seven Days had left the Army and when Jackson had gloriously redeemed his inaction in front of Richmond. This fact, coupled with Lee's unfailing consideration for the feelings of others, prompted him to pass lightly over blunders and omissions that would have explained why the Federal Army escaped envelopment and capture. In his official summary of the reasons why complete success was not attained, he merely stated which moves were not completed, without assigning the reasons or placing the blame. Of the wreck of his plan on the critical 30th of June, for example, he simply said, Huger not coming up, and Jackson having been unable to force the passage of White Oak Swamp, Longstreet and Hill were without the expected support. He particularized only in one respect concerning the reasons for McClellan's escape, prominent among these, he said, is the want of correct and timely information. This fact, attributable chiefly to the character of the country, enabled General McClellan skillfully to conceal his retreat and to add much to the obstructions with which nature had beset the way of our pursuing columns, but regret that more was not accomplished gives way to gratitude to the sovereign ruler of the universe for the results achieved. But if Lee did not deem it expedient to state why he failed to destroy the Federal Army, the causes were plain and, to the student of war, are the most instructive aspect of the campaign. Many of them are informative and monitory in a different tactical era. The one of correct and timely information, which Lee emphasized was, first of all, a matter of cartography in a country by nature so difficult for military operations that a leader without an accurate map was almost helpless. The absence of reliable maps proved as serious throughout the campaign as it had been in the instances already cited, at Mechanicsville and at Fraser's Farm. A better knowledge of the country might have shown Lee how he could have avoided the bloody Battle of Gaines's Mill by striking directly for dispatch station. Unfamiliarity with the roads slowed down the march and confused the division commanders, in particular General Jackson, who was entirely unacquainted with the country. Bad maps put Magruder on the wrong road on July 1st, and bad maps delayed pursuit on July 3rd. D. H. Hill summed up the case when he said, Throughout this campaign we attacked just when and where the enemy wished us to attack. This was owing to our ignorance of the country and lack of reconnaissance of the successive battlefields. Nearly all the mistakes due to lack of acquaintance with the country affected seriously the outcome of the campaign. This, therefore, is a pertinent question, to what extent can Lee be held accountable for the failure to produce good maps of the country below Richmond? The responsibility is not altogether his, assuredly, for he was not in charge of operations until March, 1862. There were only 13 engineer officers in the Confederate service who had belonged to the Engineering Corps of the United States Army at the outbreak of the war. Engineers of the Confederate Provisional Army, who had come from civil pursuits, numbered no more than 93. The field commanders were continually asking for more engineering assistance. Topographical engineers were almost unprocurable. Among all the published documents on the preliminaries of the seven days, there is no mention of maps, good or bad. As Lee was himself an engineer, whose experience at Puebla in collecting topographical data had shown him their value, it is inconceivable that he did not realize the necessity of having an accurate map. He doubtless knew that a map was being prepared, he did not know, and he could not know until it was checked on the ground that the one supplied him was so full of errors as to be worthless.
President Davis blamed General Johnston for failure to reconnoiter the roads and attributed to his negligence the embarrassment of Lee, but the conditions that impeded the engineers while Lee was in command applied equally, perhaps even more, while Johnston was responsible for army administration. Amateurish and incompetent staff work was a second factor in denying the army commanders correct and timely information. Colonel Wolseley, later Field Marshal Lord Wolseley, who visited Lee's headquarters in the autumn, remarked that the staff organization in the Confederacy was not as well established, during the seven days, as it is now. Everyone in the South will tell you that McClellan's army was saved, first by General Lee's orders not being accurately executed, and, secondly, by his gunboats. The first part of this statement is a very conservative summary of the case. The campaign will always remain a tragic monument to defective staff work. Following it stage by stage, battle by battle, one gets a singular impression of Lee's detachment. He was responsible for the outcome yet in the dark respecting the most important movements of some of the commanders charged with important duties. There were long hours in the campaign when Lee knew scarcely more of the whereabouts of his troops than McClellan did. The condition was so glaring and so continuous that a detailed list of the errors of the staff would be a review of the campaign. None of the battles began until late afternoon, because the staff could not get the columns up earlier, there was no satisfactory liaison between Jackson and Lee or between A.P. Hill and Jackson on June 26, although operating in a friendly country where almost every farmer was potentially a Confederate spy, Lee's intelligence service was nearly non-existent. He thought, for example, that virtually the whole of the Federal Army was in his front on June 27, when, in reality, he faced only Fitz John Porter's corps until nearly the close of the action at Gaines's Mill. The failure of the staff to effect coordination in the attack that day speaks for itself. Again, on June 30, Huger's movements for some hours were unreported either by Lee's staff officers or by Huger's, in spite of the fact that Huger could hear the fire of Longstreet's guns at Fraser's farm and Lee could hear those of Huger on the Charles City Road, the lack of contact with Jackson on June 30 was almost complete, it is not certain that Lee knew of Holmes's advance until late on the 29th of June. As for Malvern Hill, there might as well have been no headquarters staff for all the good it did in seeing that the senior officer on each part of the line was familiar with the general situation and knew what was expected of him. Some of Lee's staff officers were men of ability, who later were to prove invaluable to him, but in this campaign they functioned simply as the inexperienced staff of the average division commander might have done. The reasons for this were in part a lack of training and in part a bad organization. Lee had brought back with him from South Carolina only Captain Walter H. Taylor, and he had recalled Major T. A. Washington about April 3 and Major A. L. Long in May. Under the Act of March 25, which provided him with a staff of a colonel as military secretary and four aides ranking as major, Lee had named Long as military secretary, had retained Taylor, and for the other vacancies had chosen Major Charles S. Venable, Major Charles Marshall, and Major T. M. R. Talcott, son of his old friend Captain Andrew Talcott. Major Washington had left the staff late in April. On assuming command of the Army of Northern Virginia on June 1, Lee had continued Captain A. P. Mason, of Johnston's staff, as Assistant Adjutant General. On June 4, Lt. Col. R. H. Chilton, a comrade of Lee's Texas days, had reported to Lee as Assistant Adjutant and Inspector General, and had been announced as Chief of Staff. At first, Lee had somewhat awkwardly called his staff about him every morning and had distributed routine papers among them with a verbal outline of the answers, but he had soon discarded this arrangement and had designated Major Taylor as Assistant Adjutant General to care for all the regular correspondence. That had been about the extent of the personal staff. Colonel Chilton, a West Pointer, was somewhat of a misfit, more than an aide but less than a chief of staff. Major Taylor was an admirable officer, young and diligent, whose only weakness was a longing for field service. Whenever opportunity offered, at Seven Pines on June 1, on the Rapidan in 1863, in the Wilderness on May 10, 1864, and at Petersburg on March 31, 1865, he took advantage of presence at the scene of action to lead desperate charges with conspicuous valor. Marshall, a Baltimore lawyer, was excellent in drafting papers, Talcott was an able engineer, and Venable a man of most superior intellect, but none of the staff, except Taylor and Long, had been with Lee for more than a few months when this campaign opened, and Chilton had been at headquarters only a few weeks. 
the general staff officers, inherited from Johnston, were more experienced and were strengthened conspicuously on the eve of the campaign by the addition of Lt. Col. James L. Corley, Assistant Quartermaster General, but these officers were not in close touch with the commanding general. Lee, for that matter, was scarcely more adept in handling his staff at this time than the officers were in serving him. In the sense, then, that General Randolph B. Marcy acted for McClellan, Lee had no chief of staff. A comparison between Chilton and Marcy is typical of the difference in the staff work of the two armies as a whole during this campaign and measures Lee's burden in this respect with approximate accuracy. The Federals in 1861 had the immense advantage of beginning the war with all the divisions of the staff organized and operating. Except in their intelligence service, which was wretched, the Union armies were still enjoying this advantage at the time of the Seven Days Battles. The Federal staff work during the change of base was well-nigh flawless. McClellan had felt it necessary to maintain troops north of Chickahominy to defend the Richmond and York River Railroad, but his eyes had been opened by Stewart's raid of June 1315 to the possible necessity of having to abandon the base at the White House, and on June 18 he ordered transports and supplies up the James. Until the afternoon of the 27th, the activity of Lee's army on the staff side of the Chickahominy was so deceptive that McClellan was not certain where the major blow would fall. That day, while the battle was raging at Gaines's mill, Marcy hinted at a change of base in a dispatch to Secretary E. M. Stanton. The same evening it was determined upon, after brief consideration of the alternative of an advance on Richmond up the south side of the Chickahominy, which on June 23 had been discussed. At 2 a.m., June 28, General Morrell marched his weary, shattered brigades across the Chickahominy. From that time until the morning of July 3, some part of the army was continuously on the road with an immense train that included 3,450 wagons, 2,518 beef cattle, 52 field batteries, and all the reserve artillery. Much was destroyed before the retreat began and much was thrown away by the soldiers on the march, but the withdrawal was orderly except at White Oak Swamp Bridge on the night of June 29 and on the road from Malvern Hill to Harrison's Landing, July 1-2. It is hardly too much to say that McClellan owed his escape primarily to the excellence of his staff and to the inefficiency of Lee's. If McClellan had not relied upon an intelligence service that was immeasurably worse than none, deceiving him with wild lies and wilder guesses regarding the strength of the Confederate forces opposing him, the difference in the two staffs might have been the difference between failure and success, despite the strategy of Lee and the almost incredible timidity of McClellan. But Lee's lack of correct and timely information was due, in part, to something besides poor maps and bad staff work. A third and not inconsiderable factor was the faulty employment of the cavalry during the closing days of the operations. At the outset, the mounted men were well located and handled. Stuart was most needed to cover Jackson's advance and was most successful in doing so. No fault can be found with the tactical use of the cavalry on June 26. The next day brought little opportunity for employing that arm in the wooded country around Cold Harbor. When McClellan sealed the front of the Chickahominy on June 28, it was proper to send Stuart down the left bank to see if the Army of the Potomac intended to cross that stream in a withdrawal down the peninsula. Again, the discovery that communications with the White House had been abandoned by the enemy made it desirable that the cavalry destroy the supplies at the base. This was done. But from that time until the morning of July 1, Stuart was useless to the Army. His troopers remained beyond Chickahominy, resting and observing the crossings, when they could have been scouting or assailing the wagon trains moving southward. Had the cavalry been divided on June 29 and half of it returned to Lee, it is not likely that the line of the enemy's retreat to the James would have been in doubt, or that the prospect of a concentration at Malvern Hill would have gone unreported. Aside from these three conditions, that costly, correct and timely information, there were other reasons why the Army of Northern Virginia failed to achieve the full triumph Lee believed it should have won. The poor use made of the Confederate artillery, in comparison with the admirable employment of that arm by the Federals, was one of these reasons. To this was due the prolongation of several of the battles when speed might have enlarged a victory. Costly casualties were piled up in infantry charges on batteries that massed artillery preparation might have silenced. It was one of the greatest errors of the early days of the Confederacy, wrote Captain Francis W. Dawson, that batteries were allowed to be knocked to pieces in detail when, by massing a dozen batteries, the enemy could have been knocked quickly out of time and many lives saved.
Gun for gun the Confederate ordnance was far inferior to the Federal in range and in precision. Lee's one hope of winning equality, not to speak of gaining superiority, depended on better tactical employment. Yet what were the facts? At Mechanicsville the few Confederate batteries that got into action made no impression on the well-placed Federal guns, at P. Hill used little artillery at Gaines's mill, and Jackson could not mass his pieces soon enough to protect his infantry, at Fraser's farm the Confederate artillerists had little opportunity, Malvern Hill was comparable only to Sharpsburg, the southern gunners Hades. Only in Jackson's operation at White Oak Swamp Bridge was there any effective massing of ordnance, and the temporary advantage gained there was not followed up soon enough by a strong infantry attack. Some of the circumstances responsible for this poor showing by the Confederate artillery were of a sort not easily overcome, the Federals had chosen and had prepared the better positions. The actions at Mechanicsville and at Gaines's Mill had been joined before the artillery could be brought up in adequate strength. Unknown roads, troublesome marshes, and dense forests had to be passed before the faithful gunners could bring their poor pieces to bear on the excellent Federal batteries. The reserve artillery rendered little service. Apart from all this, however, as the campaign is reviewed, one feels that Lee and all his division commanders except Jackson failed to put a proper valuation on the coordination of the infantry and the artillery. Reliance was placed, at cruel cost, on the naked valor of the infantry. General Pendleton had not shown in the seven days, but he appraised the failure of his arm with absolute candor in his report, too little was thrown into action at once, he said, too much was left in the rear and used. We needed more guns taking part, alike, for our own protection and for crippling the enemy. With a powerful array opposed to his own, we divide his attention, shake his nerves, make him shoot at random, and more readily drive him from the field worsted and alarmed. A main cause of this error in the present case was no doubt a peculiar intricacy in the country from the prevalence of woods and swamps. We could form little idea of positions and were very generally ignorant of those chosen by the enemy and of the best modes of approaching them. The Federals were conscious of their advantage, despite the loss of 52 guns. One newspaper correspondent went so far as to say, our superiority in artillery has saved the army from annihilation. Another reason for Lee's failure to win a decisive victory during the campaign was his disposition to rely too largely on subordinates, some of whom failed to measure up either to their responsibility or to their opportunities. Longstreet realized this. Self-opinionated as he was in vain as he became, he wrote after the war, Lee depended almost too much on his officers for the execution of his orders. Here again the explanation is fairly simple. Lee had been trained in the school of Scott, who conceived it to be the function of the commanding general to devise the strategic plan, to bring the troops on the field at the proper time and place, and then to leave tactics and combat to the division commanders. Lee rarely departed in this respect from his practical instruction in Mexico. In the second place, Lee's consideration for the sensibilities of others, that refined quality so often mentioned in these pages, made it temperamentally difficult for him to dominate a field. Moreover, it must again be remembered that he was a newcomer among commanders who had an esprit de corps of a kind and were jealous of their authority. In the case of Jackson, his popular reputation at the time was higher than that of Lee himself. The victor of Cross Keys and Port Republic had to be treated deferentially. Had the personal equation been different, had Lee been disposed to deal sternly, it is doubtful if the staff could have functioned to see that his orders were promptly and literally enforced. Besides, the troops he led during the Seven Days were not a united force, accustomed to working together, but consisted of four separate armies, met together for the first time on the field of battle, Johnston's old Army of the Potomac, the Valley Army of Jackson, Huger's command from the Norfolk Front, and Magruder's brigades, which might be styled the Yorktown Army. One result of this conglomerate organization was that Mechanicsville was a P. Hill's battle, Savage Station was Magruder's, and Fraser's farm was Longstreet's. Malvern Hill was nobody's. Only at Gaines's mill, and then only for part of the day, was the action really Lee's own. Finally, the campaign did not lead to the destruction of the enemy because Lee faced an army that was so handled on the field of battle as to make the most of its of excellent personnel. Writing long after the war, with most of the essential evidence before him, Colonel Walter Taylor placed high among the causes preventing a more complete victory the character and personality of the men behind the guns on the federal side.
He added, the army under General McClellan was made up largely of the flower of the manhood of the northern and eastern states, and his lieutenants were men and soldiers of a very high type. This is no more than justice. In nearly every clash during the seven days, when infantry was matched against infantry, the already terrible footmen of the Army of Northern Virginia showed their superiority, but it was not by a wide margin, nor was it with the aid of superior tactical dispositions on the part of their general-in-chief. Lee showed no genius of this sort at any time during the seven days. Mechanicsville was not tactically well fought from the Confederate point of view. At Gaines's Mill, for a multitude of reasons, Lee's numerically superior forces were very poorly fed into action and some of his units were in danger of being destroyed in detail. Malvern Hill was tactically about as bad as it could have been. In the intelligent employment of the forces at hand, Fraser's Farm was the best battle of the Confederates waged during the campaign, futile though that action was. And there, it must in candor be recorded, the guiding hand was not Lee's, but Longstreet's. To summarize, then, the Federal Army was not destroyed, as Lee had hoped it would be, for four reasons, one, the Confederate commander lacked adequate information for operating in a difficult country because his maps were worthless, his staff work inexperienced, and his cavalry absent at the crisis of the campaign, two, the Confederate artillery was poorly employed, three, Lee trusted too much to his subordinates some of whom failed him almost completely, and, four, Lee displayed no tactical genius in combating a fine, well-led federal army. When these four factors are given their just valuation, the wonder is not that an honest commander had to admit that he had failed to realize his full expectation. Rather is the wonder that so much of success was attained. In the face of obstacles and failures, how was Lee able to break the grip of McClellan on Richmond and to pen up that splendid federal army in the entrenched camp at Harrison's Landing? There would seem to be three major explanations. The first, of course, was the fundamental soundness of Lee's strategy. It has been developed stage by stage in these chapters and it need not be recapitulated here. The campaign may well be cited as a textbook example of the manner in which the highest type of strategy, if consistently followed, will sometimes overcome difficulties and atone for tactical blunders. Secondly, Lee accomplished the major object of his campaign because the valor of his infantry was neither shaken by losses nor impaired by long campaigning. The reckless courage of Ripley's green troops at Mechanicsville, the steady advance of Lawton's Georgians, the charge of the 20th North Carolina, and the magnificent behavior of Hood's brigade at Gaines's Mill, the persistence of the struggle for Randall's and Cooper's guns at Fraser's Farm. The desperate determination of Wright's and Mahone's men in clinging to the hillside at the crew house even after a great assault had failed to materialize at Malvern Hill, these and like achievements show. That Lee had magnificent material at the outset, however much he improved its morale by his successful and brilliant strategy. Through the worst hardships of the campaign, the men remained wholly confident of victory and convinced that they would soon end the war. The final explanation of the outcome of the campaign was the singular temperament of Lee's chief opponent. It is beside the purpose of this biography to discuss whether McClellan or the administration was chiefly to blame for the exposure of the right flank of the Army of the Potomac at Mechanicsville after all immediate hope of reinforcement by McDowell was passed. Neither is it necessary to argue here whether Fitz John Porter was right in affirming that if McClellan had not moved to the James, after the Battle of Gaines's Mill, he would have had no alternative to hasty abandonment of his attack on Richmond, with a retirement by the route he had followed up the peninsula. These and the intriguing questions of what a different man would have done on the morning of June 28, or how he would have moved after he had repulsed Lee's attack at Malvern Hill, belong to the general military history of the war between the states. What is of bearing here is that though General McClellan was certainly the ablest organizer and probably the best military administrator developed in the North during the war, possessing his men's affection as did no other federal general-in-chief, he was not far from panic during the seven days. This may have been due to the feeling that the clique opposed to him had wrought his ruin by withholding McDowell. It may have been that in dealing with Lee he was still a lieutenant of engineers in Mexico. Perhaps the main reason was that he had been deceived by his incompetent spies into believing that Lee vastly outnumbered him. It is impossible to state the precise cause or combination of causes for his condition. Whatever it may have been, it aided Lee to a degree past all reckoning. 
On the night of June 27, McClellan was so convinced he had to make a general and immediate retreat that he contemplated issuing an order for the destruction of officers' baggage and perhaps of camp equipage, calling on the men at the same time to endure privation for a few days. On the evening of the Battle of Fraser's Farm he telegraphed Stanton, If none of us escape, we shall have done honor to our country. During most of the retreat he was in advance of the army, seeking defensive positions and a safe refuge for his men. Yet on July 2 he was boasting to President Lincoln that he had lost only one gun and one wagon, and on July 9 he jubilantly reported to Washington that the enemy was in full retreat. His private letters, even after he had edited them for publication, were a curious medley of fears and bravado. Lee could not have asked for a more favorable state of mind on the part of his adversary, or for a temper more certain to bewilder an administration that had to deal with such a man. So appears the campaign after 70 years. At the time, it provoked conflicting opinions. Hostile critics of President Davis and of General Lee, balancing successes against failures, professed disappointment with Lee's generalship and with the results obtained. Said the Charleston Mercury, much as we praise the strategy, projected as we hear, by General Johnston, some time since, by which McClellan has been beaten on the Chickahominy, the blundering manner in which he has been allowed to get away, the desultory manner in which he has been pursued by divisions instead of our whole force, enabling him to repulse our attacks, to carry off his artillery, and, finally, to make a fresh stand with an army reinforced are facts, we fear, not very flattering. To the practical generalship of General Lee. Some of General Johnston's friends jealously grumbled that their hero would have made a better showing than Lee if he had been supported by the administration in concentrating as large an army as Lee had. Robert Toombs wrote Vice President Stevens that Lee was far below the occasion. And so for other critics less distinguished. But the public saw the successes, not the shortcomings. Especially in Richmond, press and people did not judge the seven days as a series of close battles but in their proper light, as a campaign of strategy that began with the first move to transfer Jackson from the valley and ended when McClellan was caged and impotent at Harrison's Landing, with his plan of operations hopelessly shattered. They remembered the Panic of May, they did not forget how they had seen the glow of bombardment and had heard above the anxious beating of their own hearts the defiant challenge of the enemy's guns. And in the contrast between June 1 and July 4, they read a mighty achievement. The people at large, one observer testified, greeted Lee as the author of a great deliverance worked out for them. Some were most eulogistic. The operations of General Lee, the Richmond Dispatch affirmed, were certainly those of a master. No captain that ever lived could have planned or executed a better plan. Its success places its author among the highest military names. A correspondent of the Richmond Inquirer insisted, never has such a result been achieved in so short a time and with so small cost to the victors. I do not believe the records of modern warfare can produce a parallel when the battle is considered in this aspect. Lee, said the Richmond Whig, has amazed and confounded his detractors by the brilliancy of his genius, the fertility of his resources, his energy and daring. He has established his reputation forever and has entitled himself to the lasting gratitude of his country. Thoughtful men saw in the outcome a vindication of the president's policy and the hope of a long period of successes in arms. More important, far, than popular acclaim was the confidence and admiration aroused among the soldiers in the ranks. Within a month, the king of spades became the father of his men, trusted and idolized. He gave them the causerie de bivouac that Napoleon considered essential to the morale of a victorious army. Stories of his simplicity, of his devotion, and of his humility began to go the rounds. The troops already felt that he was superior to the best general the enemy had, and that their lives and their cause were safe in his hands. After this first campaign, their faith in him was unbounded. Back in his old headquarters at the Dabbs house, Lee gave little time and less thought to the reading of the newspapers that were discounting his performance or sounding his praises. The many evidences of the goodwill of the army and the marked deference now shown him by officers who had been slightly superior in manner wrought no change in his treatment of them. He had passed through the most fruitful period of his military education, barring perhaps those months under Scott in 1847 on the road to Mexico City, and he was determined to profit by it in correcting his own mistakes and in overcoming, so far as he could, the defects his subordinates had disclosed.
His immediate task was to reorganize the army for the campaigns he knew were before him. The most pressing part of that task, of course, was to provide better divisional leadership. Longstreet had emerged as the most dependable man, at the moment, among his lieutenants. He did not fail to put a high estimate on his opinions and he did not hesitate to express his theories of strategy, but he had exhibited, as yet, no stubbornness. His movements had been prompt and his discipline good. In battle, he had displayed a brusque cheerfulness and a quick understanding of troop movements and positions. More fully than any other division commander he had shown himself worthy of trust with a larger command. D. H. Hill was caustic and critical, but in action he had been admirable. I. P. Hill was too impetuous, but he had marched well and had fought hard. His conduct at Fraser's farm had been above criticism. A little more seasoning under the guidance of a steadier man would make him an efficient divisional commander. Magruder, brave and loyal for all his pompous manner, was too excitable for such fighting as lay ahead. Fortunately, the question of disposing of him had been solved in advance, he had been offered command in the Trans-Mississippi Department, was anxious to go there, and waited only long enough to defend himself against whispered imputations of poor generalship at Malvern Hill. His large force was promptly broken up, d. R. Jones's division was placed with Longstreet's command, and Magruder's own small division was consolidated with McClaws's, under the command of McClaws. Neither Jones nor McClaws had been sufficiently tested to show his qualities. Huger's failure had been unrelieved and was irredeemable. Circumstances and perhaps design had placed most of his troops under Magruder during the action at Malvern Hill. Quietly and with the utmost consideration, he was now named Inspector of Artillery and Ordnance for the Army of the Confederacy and was to appear no more with Lee. His division was assigned to R. H. Anderson of South Carolina, who was promoted Major General. His abilities were good and his weakness for strong drink was believed to have been overcome. This was a change that Lee had desired to make before the opening of the campaign. Holmes had not exhibited brilliance and was slow and deaf, besides, though a competent routine administrator. Like Magruder, he was given command in the Trans-Mississippi Department. D. H. Hill was assigned in his place, with an eye to semi-independent service in his native North Carolina. There remained Jackson, what should be done about him? By every test, Jackson had failed throughout the seven days. He had not turned Beaver Dam Creek, though he had fulfilled the letter of his orders. At Gaines's mill he had done no more than the others, if as much. His failure to support Magruder at Savage Station had been inexplicable, and the reasons for his failure to cross White Oak Swamp were at best debatable. In the Battle of Malvern Hill his division had achieved little. Although the army was so much elated that there was little disposition to find fault, ugly tales about Jackson were in circulation. He was reported to have said he did not intend his men should do all the fighting. Without stopping to ask whether the figures might not have some other explanation, critics may have thought this rumor was verified by the fact that Jackson's and Ewell's divisions, the original Army of the Valley, had sustained less than 6% of the casualties of the campaign. Had Jackson fought as hard and done as well as Longstreet and A. P. Hill, there would have been a different tale to tell. Lee may have felt this. He never had the slightest doubt concerning Jackson's ability, his discretion, or his daring independent command, but he may have feared that Jackson was ambitious and ill-disposed to fight under another. A certain letter that will be quoted in describing the reorganization of the army after the Battle of Sharpsburg gives color to this view. Yet Jackson had done well during the early months of the war, as Lee well knew, and he had to his credit the amazing campaign in the valley that had shown of what he was capable. Lee could not overlook past performance. He may have been aware, also, of Jackson's physical condition. There is not a line in any letter, or a hint in the gossip of the time, so far as it has been preserved, to indicate that Lee criticized Jackson, much less that he considered quietly of disposing of him, as he did of Huger, of Holmes, and of Magruder. He retained his faith in Jackson, but he made a significant change in the organization of the army. He left Lawton's brigade to fill out Jackson's old division and he retained Ewell under the control of Jackson. Thus, if required for separate use, the Army of the Valley was intact. Whiting's division was joined with Holmes's former force under D. H. Hill.
The rest of the infantry, Longstreet's, A. P. Hills, D. H. Hills, R. H. Anderson's, and McClaws's divisions were entrusted to Longstreet. In short, Jackson fought the seven days with 14 brigades, in the reorganization he was allotted seven. Longstreet had carried six brigades across the Chickahominy, he soon had 28. The changes were made gradually and quietly and seemed to have attracted little or no attention, especially as D. H. Hill's subordination to Jackson had been recognized as temporary and due solely to the arrangement made on June 27 for the pursuit of McClellan. Nevertheless, the disproportion in the size of Longstreet's and Jackson's command must reflect, to some extent, Lee's belief at the time regarding the comparative willingness of the two men to cooperate. If Jackson was to return to independent command, his great abilities could of course be trusted, but if he was to remain with the Army of Northern Virginia and was to prove recalcitrant, his power to thwart the general strategy of the Army was to be limited. This seems a safe inference from the facts. What did Jackson think of all this? He never told anyone, so far as the records show, that he felt he had failed to do his part in the campaign. His report, when written months afterward, contained no apologies. If he did not blame himself, however, it is certain he did not blame Lee or criticize the distribution of force. The one reference he is known to have made to his chief immediately after the campaign was as full of praise as it was sincere. His perception is as quick and unerring, he said of Lee in a conversation to be quoted more fully in Chapter 20, on page 261, as his judgment is infallible. So great is my confidence in General Lee that I am willing to follow him blindfolded. The subject of this encomium was as quick to apply one of the lessons of the campaign to himself as he was to protect the army against errors by incompetent subordinates or possible mistakes by men of whom he was not yet certain. He abandoned the grand strategy of converging columns and envelopment for simpler methods that inexperienced brigade commanders and a green staff could be expected to employ more readily. Here, again, there is no direct evidence to cite. Lee's determination is to be read in what he did thereafter, not in what he then said. He was learning the duties of his position, as his subordinates were learning theirs, by experience. Never again did he attempt any such complicated maneuvering as that by which he had tried to trap McClellan at Fraser's farm. Flank attacks, quick marches to the rear, and better tactics took the place of great designs of destruction. Beyond this, Lee did not go in correcting the weaknesses the campaign disclosed. So far as the records show, he had no official part in urging the preparation of maps. Little was done in this respect during 1862. No reorganization of the artillery was undertaken. The general staff was not modified, and Lee's personal staff was not changed. As Colonel Chilton failed to develop the qualities of an efficient chief of staff, Lee came gradually to act as his own chief staff officer. Perhaps, as an engineer who had worked almost alone on many projects, it was both his impulse and his preference to do this. Increasingly, after the seven days, Lee personally drafted his important dispatches to the president. Where they were not strictly confidential, he had them copied in his official letter book. Many of the most important of those addressed to the president were forwarded without being transcribed. It seems strange, at first glance, that a man so mindful of the value of military details should have done so little to prepare maps, to make his artillery more efficient, and to build up the staff. Perhaps more might have been done. Lee, however, had already realized that Confederate success depended on utilizing the means at hand, without waiting to perfect them in competition with an enemy whose resources were so much greater than those of the Confederacy that the North would be certain to gain most by delay. Conditions had changed since 1861 and the early spring of 1862, whatever the southern states could hope to do must be done quickly. Lee had to leave much to chance and more to the accumulating experience of the army as he prepared for a dramatic new stage of the war in Virginia. Chapter 19 – A Domestic Interlude General Lee saw little of his family during the desperate weeks that raced relentlessly to the bloody climax of Malvern Hill. When in March, 1862, he came back to Richmond, Mrs. Lee was at the White House with her daughter-in-law, Charlotte. The girls were visiting, Rooney was with his command in the field, Robert was still at the University of Virginia, and only Custis was in the city, acting as an aide to the president. The general had his quarters at the Spotswood Hotel in Spartan loneliness.
His duties kept him for long hours at the War Department building and gave him few opportunities for social life. He went daily to morning prayer meeting at 7 o'clock, but he did not find time to visit even his old rector of boyhood days, now the Bishop of Virginia, Right Rev. William Meade. On the evening of March 14, Bishop Meade sent for Lee, who hurried at once to see him. The distinguished cleric was nearing his end, feeble and in great pain, but rational and resigned. In an affecting farewell, the bishop gave him his blessing. God bless you. God bless you, Robert, he said, and thank you for your high and responsible duties. I can't call you general, I must call you Robert, I have heard you your catechism too often. Yes, bishop, very often, Lee said, choking with tears and pressing his hand. That night the venerable cleric died. I ne'er shall look upon his like again, Lee sorrowfully quoted. Of all the men I have ever known, he wrote after the war, I consider him the purest. That evening, after Bishop Meade expired, Robert Lee came to town, intent on entering the army. His father had opposed this in April, 1861, but had weakened in September and now he was reconciled to it. He did not believe the boy would study at college and he did not wish him to attend simply to claim the military exemption allowed students. I must leave the rest in the hands of our merciful God, Lee told his wife. I hope our son will do his duty and make a good soldier. The next day he went with Robert to get his outfit, with which the boy left in a few days to join the Rockbridge Artillery as a private. It was in that capacity Lee next met him on the field of Gaines's mill. Lee left it to Mrs. Lee whether she would remain for the time being at the White House or would come to Richmond, though he reminded her that, in the present condition of affairs no one can foresee what may happen, nor in my judgment is it advisable for anyone to make arrangements with a view to permanency or pleasure. Mrs. Lee elected to continue at the White House, and there she stayed until the Federals were close at hand. Her impulse doubtless was to hold the plantation against McClellan and all his army, for she had the finest of courage, but she was prevailed upon to seek refuge at the home of a neighbor. Prior to May 11, she left, but not until she had penned and had attached to the front door this appeal. Northern soldiers who professed to reverence Washington forbear to desecrate the home of his first married life, the property of his wife, now owned by her descendants. A granddaughter of Mrs. Washington. A few days later, two federal officers with an escort rode up to her new shelter and asked for her. One introduced himself as Captain Joseph Kirkland, aide to General Fitz John Porter. The other was Dr. George H. Lyman, medical director of Porter's Corps. They had come, they explained, with a message from General Porter to acquaint her with his desire to assure her proper care and protection with as little of constraint to her wishes and movements as might be compatible with her position inside the federal lines. Mrs. Lee feared no federal from commanding general to foraging private, and she proceeded to give the abashed officers a piece of her mind. It was an indignity, she said, to be confined to a house with sentinels posted about, especially at the order of General Porter, who had often been a guest at Arlington. Kirkland and Lyman protested that Porter was acting under McClellan's orders and that the wish of all was to show her every possible protection until she could be passed through the lines. Mrs. Lee broke in with an emphatic announcement that she did not want to pass through the lines, she wished to return to the White House, if not yet in ruins. The puzzled Federals told her that if she desired to do so, she could journey there or anywhere else, as long as she had an escort. That did not suit her, she would not go to the White House or make any move if she had to have bluecoats buzzing about her. The officers diplomatically explained that an escort was for her protection, not for espionage, and that it was necessary if she intended moving about where ignorant soldiers might not be considerate of her sex and station. This somewhat mollified her. The visit was finally terminated with much more courtesy on her part, Dr. Lyman subsequently wrote, than our reception promised. Soon thereafter Mrs. Lee shook the dust of the federal camps from her creaking carriage wheels and journeyed up the Pamunkey to Marlborne, the estate of Edmund Ruffin, the famous agricultural experimentalist who had fired the first gun on Fort Sumter. There she remained for some weeks, only to find the on-marching Federals, ere long, at nearby Old Church. Again she was within the enemy's lines, with a suspicious colonel, confident she would soon report the movements of his command to the Confederates. This time, Mrs. Lee decided that if she was to leave the company of the Federals, she would go where she did not believe they could follow her, to Richmond.
Lee arranged with McClellan for her to pass through the lines, and not long before the opening of the seven days, he sent Major W. Roy Mason to meet her. Mason awaited her at McClellan's headquarters, where the general himself received her with due honors. Thence the carriage took her across the meadow bridges to Gooch's farm, a mile and a half from the Chickahominy. Their General Lee welcomed her. It was the first time he had seen her since he had kissed her goodbye at Arlington on April 22, 1861, fifteen months before. Physically, she had changed much for the worse during that time, as she always seemed to do in their long separations. Travel, arthritis, and suspense had aged and crippled her. Only with great difficulty was she able to walk at all. During the first weeks after Mrs. Lee's return to Richmond, the general was rarely with her, but when the seven days lay behind him, he could occasionally come into the city for a few days and could taste a little of the domestic life he so well loved. Robert got a furlough on account of minor sickness, and the girls fluttered home. The quiescence of the enemy temporarily lifted from his heart the burden of his responsibility. He was the same loving father to us all, Rode remembered, as kind and thoughtful of my mother, and of us, his children, as if our comfort and happiness were all he had to care for. His great victory did not elate him, so far as one could see. He told his wife, our success has not been so great or complete as we could have desired, but God knows what is best for us. Our enemy met with a heavy loss, from which it will take him some time to recover, before he can recommence his operations. It was not for long, Robert rejoined his command, Mrs. Lee, and some of the girls went to Hickory Hill, the Wickham home in Hanover County, and thence to the Warren County Springs in North Carolina, and soon the rumble of artillery, the clatter of cavalry, and the haunting tramp of ill-shot infantry was moving northward through the streets of Richmond. The army was moving northward to still bloodier fields, and Lee must lead it there. Chapter 20 Enter General John Pope during the six weeks following his hard battles around Richmond, Lee sought to rest, refit, reinforce, and reorganize the Army of Northern Virginia, a labor in the four hours of campaign aftermath. The infantry having been entirely withdrawn from in front of McClellan, and observation of the Federals having been left to a brigade of cavalry, which was changed at intervals, most of the troops had only routine duties to perform, and even these were suspended on Sunday. From captured and imported arms, now abundant, each regiment was uniformly armed. Worn shoes and ragged jackets were replaced. Leisure and decent rations quickly restored the health of men removed to clean camps from the malarial swamps. Reinforcement was more difficult. Except for Drayton's and Evans's brigades, which could be spared by the end of July from Charleston, no additional units could be expected. For maintaining the strength of his army, Lee had to rely on the flow of conscripts, on the return of wounded men, on the prevention of absence without leave, and on the stoppage of wasteful details. The signing on July 22 of a cartel for the general exchange of prisoners helped, also. All these measures did not suffice, however, to swell the muster rolls of the Army of Northern Virginia to the number present for duty at the opening of the Seven Days' Battles. Reorganization was necessary to fill the places of officers slain in battle and to restore the efficiency of regiments left under the command of incompetent captains, but it was retarded by slow action on recommendations for promotion and, except for the cavalry, was dangerously far from completion when the army again entered on active operations. The mounted arm was taken vigorously in hand. It needed centralized direction and it got it. Stuart was given command of all the horse, two brigades were created, Wade Hampton was put at the head of one of them, and Fitz Lee, the general's nephew, was assigned the other, though not without some grumbling at the rapid advancement of the Lees. The reorganization of Jackson's cavalry was deferred. Bickering interfered with the work of welding semi-independent divisions into an efficient army. General Toombs felt that D. H. Hill had impugned his courage and challenged him to a duel, Colonel H. L. Benning argued with so much vehemence against the constitutionality of the Conscript Act that he was in danger of arrest. Longstreet became piqued at the praise of A. P. Hill in the Richmond Examiner and had his adjutant general rejoin with a letter in the Richmond Whig that led Hill to refuse to have either personal or military dealings with that officer, whereupon Longstreet put Hill under arrest and gave command of the division for the time to Hill's senior brigadier, Joseph R. Anderson. Lee himself was not exempt from attack, despite the praise heaped upon him by the public. <laughs>
a cabal that was alleged to be seeking to undermine the confidence of the army and of the country in his capacity was denounced in the press. As usual, Li made no reply, but the multitude of vexations that were daily encountered drew from him a characteristic confession to his wife. Said he, in the prospect before me I cannot see a single ray of pleasure during this war, but as long as I can perform any service to the country, I am content. While Li was meeting these conditions as best he could, the Federals were not idle. 300,000 volunteers had been called for on July 1st, with the promise of a bounty of $100 for each man. Defeat stiffened the determination of the North. By July 10, besides the main force under McClellan at Harrison's Landing, Lee had to watch three federal armies. The shattered divisions of McDowell, Banks, and Fremont had been organized into a new Army of Virginia. Fremont had retired and had been succeeded by Brigadier General Franz Siegel. All these troops had been placed under Major General John Pope, who, in the West, had won some reputation for activity. Lee did not know whether these forces had been consolidated or where they were located, but he assumed them to be in the general vicinity of Manassas. A second additional column was known to be around Fredericksburg. Like the Army of Virginia, its strength had not been reported, but Lee's earlier reports had indicated that it was large. The third force, likewise of undetermined numbers, had come from Burnside in North Carolina and was on transports off Fortress Monroe. These troops were disposed strategically. If Burnside's men joined McClellan, they would presumably make good, or almost make good, his losses during the seven days. If they moved to Fredericksburg, they might be strong enough to duplicate the movement projected for McDowell in the spring and advance southward from that point to Richmond or, at the least, trouble communications between Richmond and Western Virginia via the Virginia Central Railroad. And if, finally, the force from Burnside or the Fredericksburg garrison, or both of them, should reinforce Pope, that officer would be dangerously strong and could cut the Virginia Central Railroad, march eastward toward Richmond, or force Lee to make so large a detachment to meet him as to put Richmond in danger of capture by McClellan. It was, in some respects, potentially as dangerous a state of affairs as that which had confronted Lee when he took command. He had then been taxed to bring together all available troops in front of Richmond to meet a concentration there by the enemy. Now, with a superior force still immediately in his front, he had to decide this difficult question, should he continue his concentration so as to checkmate McClellan, or should he disperse his forces in order to protect his communications and to prevent a still more dangerous reinforcement of his principal adversary? Lee did not meet this situation with any large strategic plan, quickly conceived and steadfastly executed. His initial planning was not a matter of prescience or even of precision. Knowing comparatively little of the intentions of his opponents, he had to shape his plan, step by step, as his information accumulated. The starting point was the fact that the battles for Richmond had given to the retention of that city a moral value out of all proportion to its importance as a railroad junction or even as a munition center. The occupation of the capital, despite all attacks to capture it, became so much a matter of prestige that it formed the basis of Lee's strategy during the months that were to follow, without any formal declaration of military policy to that effect. As early as July, 1862, the chief Virginia city was symbolically the Verdun of the South. If Richmond was to be held, then, of course, it must be fortified further, especially on the front where it would be most exposed to combined land and water attacks. To this work, Lee now gave himself as assiduously as he had to the construction of the light defensive line early in June. At Drury's Bluff, on the north side of the river opposite that point, and across the roads paralleling the James, heavy works rose steadily. Ere long, these were entrusted to Lt. Col. J. F. Gilmer, a most capable engineer. The faithful creator of the first defenses, Col. W. H. Stevens, was sent to Petersburg to prepare that city for possible investment. Improvement of the Richmond fortifications, while of high importance in protecting the city against McClellan, would of course make it less difficult for Lee to detach troops in case the forces in northern Virginia seriously threatened in advance. Jackson, who was now rested and full of ardor, was for an immediate offensive that would sweep past Pope's army and carry the war into the enemy's country. Lee listened patiently, but as he had known Pope casually in the old army and had no very high estimate of his abilities, he was for some days less alarmed than was Stonewall and would not commit himself on Jackson's proposal.
With McClellan still dangerously close to Richmond and at the head of an army larger than his own, Lee was averse to weakening himself, at least until he knew what Pope would attempt to do. Jackson was not satisfied. At the first opportunity, he sought out Colonel A. R. Bottler, who was a member of Congress as well as an acting member of his staff. Do you know that we are losing valuable time here? Jackson began. How so? Bottler replied. Why, by repeating the blunder we made after the Battle of Manassas, in allowing the enemy leisure to recover from his defeat and ourselves to suffer by inaction. Yes, and he became excited as he went on, we are wasting precious time and energies in this malarious region that can be much better employed elsewhere and I want to talk to you about it. He then explained that as McClellan was beaten, he would have to reorganize and reinforce his army before it would be in fighting trim, and that this assured the safety of Richmond. Advantage should be taken of this to invade the North. He wanted Bottler to go forthwith to see the president, to urge this course on him, and to say for Jackson that he was not making this proposal in any spirit of self-seeking, but, on the contrary, would serve under any one Davis designated. What is the use of my going to Mr. Davis, Bottler asked, as he'll probably refer me again to General Lee. So why don't you yourself speak to General Lee upon the subject? I have already done so, Jackson said. Well, what does he say? He says nothing. And then he added carefully, don't think I complain of his silence, he doubtless has good reason for it. Then, Bottler inquired, half curiously, you don't think that General Lee is slow in making up his mind? Slow, exclaimed Jackson with much energy. By no means, Colonel. On the contrary, his perception is as quick and unerring as his judgment is infallible. But with the vast responsibilities now resting on him, he is perfectly right in withholding a hasty expression of his opinions and purposes. He paused for a moment and then he said, So great is my confidence in General Lee that I am willing to follow him blindfolded. But I fear he is unable to give me a definite answer now because of influences at Richmond, where, perhaps, the matter has been mentioned by him and may be under consideration. I, therefore, want you to see the President and urge the importance of prompt action. Bottler duly called on Mr. Davis and stated Jackson's views. He subsequently thought that it was on this representation that Jackson was moved, but he was mistaken in this. The first shift in the army was brought about by the receipt of news on July 12 that the Federals had occupied Culpeper Courthouse that morning. Culpeper was on the Orange and Alexandria, now the Southern Railway. It is only 35 miles north of Gordonsville. And Gordonsville lay on an exposed bend of the Virginia Central Railroad, the only direct line of rail communication between Richmond and the Shenandoah Valley. A serious threat in that quarter was an immediate menace to an indispensable line and had to be met at any cost. Desirable as it was to await the development of the enemy's plan, Lee did not feel that he could delay in defending the line of the Virginia Central, now that Pope was moving southward. On the 13th, therefore, he ordered Jackson with his own and Ewell's division to proceed by train to Louisa and, if Pope had not anticipated him, to proceed to Gordonsville. Part of Jackson's cavalry was sent to Hanover Junction. This was the first time Lee had been called upon to apply in Virginia a principle he doubtless had learned in South Carolina that it is easier to defend a railroad by massing troops at salient and commanding points to repress the attack of the enemy and strike him if he advances than to extend the force along the whole line. He did not scatter infantry along the railroad, which was perpendicular to the line of Pope's advance and consequently exposed for a long distance. Instead, he kept Jackson's troops together to strike the invader as he approached the railway. Against cavalry raids he had to guard as best he could with his own horse, but he kept this equally concentrated, except for outposts and vedettes. When Jackson was forced to withdraw his cavalry from Hanover Junction, Lee replaced it by part of Stuart's command, though not in time to prevent a dash by Federal cavalry to Beaver Dam Station on the Virginia Central Railroad on July 20. The raid yielded the Federals nothing of consequence except the person of a young cavalry captain who was taken prisoner while waiting for a train. He was to prove a very costly capture. Arrived at Gordonsville, Jackson could learn little of his adversary's strength and movements, but thought the Federals were withdrawing from Fredericksburg to concentrate against him.
As Lee was not positive as to the size of the force at Fredericksburg, he directed Stuart to scout in that direction and to find out what was afoot. While Stuart was undertaking this, Pope brought his new Army of Virginia before the Confederate commander in a novel fashion by the issuance of an extraordinary series of orders. On taking command, he assured his troops that he was accustomed to see only the backs of his enemies, and he admonished his soldiers to dismiss from their minds certain phrases, which, said he, I am sorry to find so much in vogue amongst you. I hear constantly of taking strong positions and holding them, of lines of retreat and bases of supplies. Let us discard such ideas. Let us study the probable lines of retreat of our enemies, and leave our own to take care of themselves. This bombast aroused only ridicule as much in the North as in the South. His later orders were more serious. One of them directed his army to live off the country in which it operated and to reimburse only loyal citizens. Another order put on each community the expense of making good the damage done by guerrillas and threatened the instant destruction of any house from which any soldier was shot. A third mandate provided for the arrest of all male non-combatants within the federal lines and for the expulsion of those who refused to take the oath and to give security for their good behavior. Any person who returned after being sent away, as well as any person within the lines who communicated with the enemy, was liable to the penalty of death. A mother who wrote her son a letter could be treated as a spy under this order. One of Pope's subordinates, Brigadier General A. Von Steinwehr, outdid his chief in arresting five citizens of the town of Luray with the announcement that whenever a guerrilla killed a soldier of his, one of these hostages would be shot unless the guerrilla was forthwith delivered to the federal commander. Lee had felt that McClellan had been brutal in destroying the medicine needed for the sick and wounded left behind at Savage Station, and now his wrath rose hotly at these orders of Steinwehr and Pope. To all strategic considerations for driving Pope back from the vicinity of the Virginia Central Railroad, there was added in Lee's mind a strong desire to relieve the civil population of an alleged form of mistreatment previously unknown in the war. Lee twice wrote that Pope must be suppressed, a word that seems to have reflected his state of mind with precision. In one of his dispatches he referred to him as the miscreant Pope, and in a private letter, when he mentioned his nephew Louis Marshall, who had sided with the North, he remarked, I could forgive, his, fighting against us, but not his joining Pope. For no other adversary in the entire war did Lee have anything that approached the contempt and personal dislike he had for Pope. He was in entire accord with the orders he received from the president to notify the federal administration that the Confederacy would be compelled to retaliate if the offensive orders were enforced. Thus far Lee had developed only two of the fundamentals of a new campaign, namely, to strengthen the Richmond fortifications so as to make a detachment of force possible, and, secondly, to guard his communications with the valley. Pope was quiet for some days after reaching Culpeper, but Burnside's troops remained aboard transports off Old Point, as if preparing for another voyage, and on July 22 the Army of the Potomac began to show signs of activity. Lee was not immediately alarmed by these stirrings in the camps of McClellan, for experience had taught him the federal commander was slow to complete preparations for an offensive. Anticipating that he would have a period of grace before McClellan felt himself ready to strike, Lee began to study the third step in the development of a new plan, he began to ask himself whether he could send enough men to Jackson to defeat Pope, and then return them to Richmond in time to meet McClellan, precisely as he had hurried Whiting to Jackson early in June. Such a move manifestly depended on being able to meet three conditions, first, Pope must be near enough to permit Jackson to reach him without detaining too long the additional troops dispatched from Richmond, second, McClellan must not meantime receive sufficient reinforcements to undertake a speedy offensive, and, third, enough troops must be left at Richmond to protect the city from capturing Casely underestimated the time McClellan would require for a resumption of the offensive. This last was a serious matter. After Jackson's departure, Lee had only 69,732 men present for duty, including Holmes's former command that had been returned to the south side of the James. He had to assume that his adversary was far stronger than that. From July 23rd to July 27th, Lee wrestled over the logistics of this aspect of his plan. McClellan's activities increased. Longstreet was compelled to move an infantry force to New Market Heights, which were on the line of the shortest advance from Harrison's Landing to Richmond. Lee was uncertain whether McClellan was demonstrating to deceive him, or testing out the strength of the Confederates in his front, or preparing for a serious advance. 
In any case, unless some decision was soon reached and put in execution, both Lee and Jackson might be assaulted. So reasoning, Lee reached the solution, the two brigades that were coming from South Carolina would arrive on July 28th. They would number 4,000 men. Lee would incorporate them in his army and would send 18,000 veterans forthwith to Jackson for a blow against Pope. This would leave 56,000 men on the James. Lee would take his chances of holding Richmond with that number. To discourage and delay McClellan's advance, he would organize a diversion on the south side of the James against McClellan's base and would endeavor to interrupt the transport of supplies to McClellan by employing artillery on the lower James. In this way, Jackson might be strong enough to dispose of Pope, and McClellan might be held back until this was done, or, if McClellan advanced, a sufficient force would be at hand to maintain a good defensive on the newly fortified Richmond front. Who should go to Jackson? Not Longstreet, because he would be needed at Richmond. The next man in ability and equipment was a P. Hill. But he was still under arrest, and his senior brigadier, L. O. B. Branch, was as yet too inexperienced, in Lee's opinion, to be entrusted with a division. Hill must be restored to duty. Longstreet's theory of discipline, which had inspired that officer's arrest, must be subordinated to the army's necessity. There was, however, another possible embarrassment. The commander of the Light Division was high-spirited and sensitive. Jackson played a lone hand, was stern in his discipline and was secretive in his methods. There was danger that Hill and Jackson might not work well in harness. Lee determined to provide against this in the most direct manner. In a letter to Jackson, he dropped a hint that was as positive as it was diplomatic. At P. Hill you will, I think, find a good officer, with whom you can consult, and by advising with your division commanders as to your movements much trouble will be saved you in arranging details, as they can act more intelligently. I wish to save you trouble from my increasing your command. All this being arranged, Lee anticipated by one day the arrival of the two brigades from South Carolina and, on July 27, took the third step in the development of his plan, and Pete Hill, with his division and the Louisiana Brigade, was ordered to Gordonsville. I want Pope to be suppressed, Lee repeated. Hill's men moved quietly away on the day their orders were received. The Army of Northern Virginia was reduced by 20%. Yet there is missing from Lee's correspondence the tension observable when he had faced the converse of the problem two months before and had been feeding troops to the Richmond line. Although Lee did not minimize his difficulties or display any rashness, his dispatches were calm and most of his movements assured. Three reasons may be advanced for this. First, he had acquired some experience in the quick transfer of large bodies of men on the interior lines, second, he was confident of the fighting qualities of his army, and third, he was beginning to read with more assurance the minds of the men who opposed him. Pope he never took very seriously, McClellan he respected but understood. But for these psychological factors, the situation would have seemed most unpromising, with Pope strong on the upper Rappahannock, a force of unknown numbers at Fredericksburg, Burnside presumably still on his transports off Fort Monroe, and the Army of the Potomac in the entrenched camp at Harrison's Landing, supported by a navy that had undisputed command of the sea. McClellan was believed to have received an accession of numbers and was known to have a force much larger than Lee's. If, therefore, Burnside should reinforce McClellan after Hill's departure had left Lee with only 56,000, an advance on Richmond would be a serious matter. On the other hand, if Burnside should join Pope, he would give the Army of Virginia a number of men in excess of the 30,000 to 36,000 that Lee calculated Jackson would have on Hill's arrival. Burnside's movements consequently became of the utmost moment to Lee, who watched them at the end of July with more immediate concern than he felt either for Jackson or for his own army. The junction of Burnside and McClellan was a risk that had to be taken. Nothing could be done to prevent it. If it happened at once, only the completion of strong defenses and the stubbornest sort of fighting would negative it. If it were delayed, Jackson and Hill might meantime dispose of Pope and again be available for duty on the James. Meantime, Lee pushed the work on the fortification of Richmond and developed his plan to delay and interrupt McClellan's offensive preparation by the projected operation against his shipping. As Lee studied this diversion, he became impressed with its possibilities.
he believed that if he could bring a heavy fire to bear on Harrison's landing and could assail from the riverbanks the Federal supply vessels ascending the James, he could anchor McClellan to his base. This might make it possible to detach still more troops to Jackson, and thereby to drive, if not to destroy Pope. It was as Lee dwelt on the great results he might achieve if he could further reinforce Jackson that the first glimpse of the next stage of his larger strategy is to be had. The details of the operation against McClellan's entrenched camp and supply line were assigned to Generals S. G. French and D. H. Hill. The concentration of artillery was entrusted to General W. N. Pendleton. Preparations were made with some care. Coggins Point, on the south side of the James, opposite Harrison's, was chosen as the most favorable position. Forty-three guns, large and small, were secretly concentrated there. On the night of July 31st to August 1st, a violent bombardment of the Federal entrenched camp was begun. It caused much confusion but inflicted slight damage, and before daylight it was abandoned as the guns had to be withdrawn to avoid capture. Lee determined to persist in annoying his opponent, but when McClellan made the obvious countermove by sending a force across the James and occupying Coggins Point on August 3rd, Lee had to admit his inability to drive him away. The whole operation was written down as a failure, except, Lee thought, as it might delay the start of McClellan's offensive a few days, at a time when every day might count. If it was impossible to interfere materially with McClellan's occupation of Harrison's Landing, there was nothing at the moment that Lee could do except to prepare to resist McClellan's expected advance as vigorously as he might, and, in case of necessity, to recall Jackson and Hill, leaving Pope to do his worst against the Virginia Central Railroad. Meantime, the idea that had occurred to him while he was projecting the Coggins Point expedition must have shaped itself in an insistent question, was there any way by which he could strengthen Jackson so as to assure the destruction of Pope? About this time, there arrived as an exchanged prisoner of war the young captain who had been made prisoner on July 20 at Beaver Dam Station by the Federal Cavalry in their raid. This officer was none other than John S. Mosby, subsequently head of the famous Rangers that bore his name. Mosby had been sent to Fort Monroe, and, while awaiting exchange, had kept his eyes open and had shrewdly questioned his guards. He had concluded from what he had seen and heard that Burnside's expedition was about to sail to Fredericksburg to join Pope's army, and he hastened to communicate to Lee that conclusion and the reasons for it. If Mosby was correct, his news manifestly was of the greatest moment and made it seem highly probable that the next major effort of the enemy was to be in northern Virginia. But on August 5, the evidence seemed to indicate that the long awaited offensive by McClellan was underway. The Confederate cavalry reported a heavy force advancing up the left bank of the James toward Richmond. Lee set himself for a shock. He put three divisions in motion the next day and found McClellan drawn up at Malvern Hill, on the very ground occupied by the Federals on July 1. This time, there was no hurried, blind attack by the Army of Northern Virginia. Instead, the Confederate lines were deliberately drawn. Arriving on the ground in person, Lee directed that the Confederate left be extended toward the Willis Church Road to command the routes that led to McClellan's rear. The Confederate right skirmished briskly with the Federals, there were many signs of approaching battle. Then, on the morning of August 7, when a clash seemed certain, an amazing situation was disclosed, the Federals had gone as they had come and soon were back at Harrison's Landing. What did this mean? Obviously, if McClellan had any immediate intention of moving on Richmond, he would not occupy the strongest approach and then evacuate it overnight. But what was up? Why had he advanced at all? Lee concluded that his opponent must have made the demonstration to cover an advance on the part of Burnside in northern Virginia. Had Burnside really gone up the Rappahannock to Fredericksburg? Was he already there? If so, what was his objective? Stuart reported rumors that there were 16,000 infantry in Fredericksburg and that 6,000 cavalry which he had dispersed had undertaken a raid on Hanover Courthouse. Were these troops a part of Pope's command or were they from Burnside? The surest means of dealing with them and with Pope's main force was, of course, for Jackson to advance. If Jackson would do that and Pope were not strong, Pope would be apt to draw to his support the troops at Fredericksburg, provided they were under his command. But if Pope were strong, and if the Fredericksburg troops were Burnside's, there was danger that they would be employed disastrously against Jackson's communications via the Virginia Central Railroad.
the only way safely to ignore the force at Fredericksburg and at the same time to protect the railroad against raids would be to send Jackson enough men for a speedy and successful blow at Pope. Then the force at Fredericksburg would have to fall back. But was it possible to strengthen Jackson further with McClellan where he was, strong and preparing, perhaps, to take a new position, even though his withdrawal from Malvern Hill indicated plainly that he was not yet ready for an offensive? Thus the argument in Lee's mind pursued a circle, caution bringing him back to the waiting policy from which his desire to suppress Pope and his concern for the Virginia Central Railroad constantly were drawing him. In his dilemma he did the only thing he could do at a distance from a situation he could not fathom, he gave discretion to Jackson. On August 7 he wrote him fully, explaining that he did not know whether he could promise the reinforcements Jackson required, he urged him not to count on them, though if possible he would send them. Then he reviewed the contingencies and especially cautioned Jackson not to attack the strong positions of the enemy but to turn them so as to draw the Federals out. I would rather you should have easy fighting and heavy victories, he said. He concluded with carte blanche, I must now leave the matter to your reflection and good judgment. Make up your mind what is best to be done under all the circumstances which surround us, and let me hear the result at which you arrive. I will inform you if any change takes place here that bears on the subject. Granting discretion to Jackson did not mean any evasion of his own responsibilities. Neither did it lead him to relax for a moment his efforts to find additional troops with which to reinforce Jackson. On the same day that he told Jackson to stand or to advance as his judgment dictated, he urged D. H. Hill to hurry the completion of the works at Drury's Bluff, as it might soon be necessary to withdraw his division for service in the field. The next day, moreover, he ordered Hood to prepare to move to Hanover Junction, where he could protect the Virginia Central Railroad or move, if necessary, to Jackson's support. Jackson did not wait for the discretionary orders Lee sent him. Having learned that a part of Pope's troops were moving southward in advance of the main army, he notified Lee of his intention to attack them and set out accordingly. On the afternoon of August 9, he found the Federals on Cedar Run in the vicinity of an eminence that bore the sinister name of Slaughter Mountain. He attacked viciously and after suffering a temporary reverse on part of his line, swept forward and drove the Federals from the field. His losses were 1276. It developed that the troops with whom he had been engaged were those of his old opponent of the valley, General N. P. Banks. Lee was delighted at Jackson's success and sent him a message of warm congratulation. The success justified the confidence that Lee had retained in Jackson even after the seven days. It showed that Jackson was himself again. Jackson, however, soon realized that he had met only the vanguard of Pope's army and that the remainder was rapidly coming up. Very prudently, on the night of August 11, he decided to withdraw closer to Gordonsville, there to await reinforcements. This move decided Lee on his course of action. The road to the Virginia Central was open. There was no longer any prospect that Jackson would be able to cripple Pope and return to Richmond in time to help in disposing of McClellan. Whatever the risks meantime, Jackson must be strengthened to strike a blow at his adversary and to save the railroad. On August 13, therefore, Lee ordered Longstreet with ten brigades to move to Jackson's aid. In dispatching Longstreet, Lee sketched a plan of advance for that officer's study on the ground. Scarcely had these orders been issued than Lee received a report that Burnside had left Fredericksburg and had joined Pope. Although the details were not wholly convincing, Lee believed the report to be correct, and he immediately directed Hood to carry out the projected movement of his division of two brigades to Hanover Junction. There he could cover the railroad and, as Burnside advanced, he could parallel him and join Longstreet. By one of the curious chances of the war, on the very day when Lee decided that he must face the risk involved in these further detachments from the James, it developed that the risk might not be so great as he had previously believed. Ever since the end of July there had been rumors that McClellan was reducing his force at Harrison's Landing, but nothing definite was reported until August 13, when an English deserter came into the Confederate lines and stated that part of McClellan's army had embarked for a move. Deserters' stories were notoriously unreliable, but this one impressed Lee as being true. He immediately instructed D. H. Hill to send scouts down the right bank of the river to ascertain the facts. The next day, August 14, D. H. Hill reported there was no doubt that Fitz John Porter had left McClellan.
Three deserters from Burnside's army averred that he had reached Fredericksburg with 12,000 men and after arriving there had been reinforced by 21 regiments. This was news of the greatest moment. Lee quickly interpreted it to indicate that a part of the Army of the Potomac was being withdrawn to support Pope. That officer would soon present a most formidable front on the line of the Virginia Central Railroad. Unless Jackson were still further reinforced, he would be overwhelmed, even with Longstreet's support. But, along with a great danger, a large opportunity was presented. If Lee could take advantage of the interior lines and concentrate against Pope before any troops from the Army of the Potomac could reach him, a great victory might be won. But it would be a race, perhaps a close race, between Lee's reinforcements, already moving by rail, to Gordonsville, and McClellan's detachments, hurrying by water down the James and up the Rappahannock or the Potomac, and thence overland. Whoever won that race might win the war. No time was to be lost. Lee acted with the utmost decision and dispatch. He immediately decided to go to Gordonsville himself, and he sounded out the president on the dispatch thither of R. H. Anderson's division, which was then at Drury's Bluff. Lee had to be diplomatic in his approach, because Mr. Davis was sensitive to any danger to Richmond. For his own part, Lee was convinced that the changed situation justified a further reduction of force on the Richmond front. The great questions in his mind were these, how large a part of McClellan's army was on the move? How many of the Confederate troops still on the James could be sent northward? How much of a lead did McClellan have? Some time could be saved by delivering the attack on Pope as soon as the troops were at hand. To assure that, Lee arranged for a council of war with Longstreet and Jackson to be held as soon as his train reached Gordonsville. As a preliminary, he telegraphed Longstreet that he inclined to attack by the right flank, and he renewed a suggestion made before Longstreet left Richmond that Stuart move around Pope's army, get in rear of it, and attack its communications. G. W. Smith, who had returned from sick leave on June 10, was put at the head of the three divisions to be left behind, and was instructed to speed the completion of the Richmond defenses and to hold them to the last extremity. In anticipation of the President's approval of the detachment of R. H. Anderson, Lee directed that officer to prepare for a movement to Gordonsville with no surplus wagons. So crowded was the 14th day of August with these arrangements that Lee did not have time to ride into Richmond and say farewell, though, with his usual care in such matters, he sent in his straw hat and a surplus undershirt to be saved for calmer summers. At four o'clock on the morning of August 15, the first stage of the transfer of the army to the new front having been completed, he took train. I go to Gordonsville, he told Custis. My after movements depend on circumstances that I cannot foresee. Such, then, was the chain of circumstances that prompted Lee to hurry troops away from Richmond with even greater speed and secrecy than he had displayed in concentrating them there two months before first had developed the sentimental necessity of holding Richmond as the symbol of Southern resistance after the battles of the Seven Days. This had found its immediate expression in a strengthening of the city's defenses, and this, in turn, had made it possible for him to detach Jackson when the arrival of Pope at Culpeper had raised fears for the safety of communications with the Valley of the Shenandoah via the Virginia Central Railroad. Pope's hard orders had next aroused Lee's indignation and had been a major factor in disposing him to send a P. Hill to strengthen Jackson for a blow at Pope as soon as he had received two brigades of reinforcements from South Carolina. To hold McClellan inactive while Jackson struck Pope, Lee had organized the Coggins Point expedition. Although this had failed, Lee's desire to dispose of Pope had steadily increased, and McClellan's advance to Malvern Hill had convinced him that Burnside was planning either to join Pope or to threaten Jackson's communications. Lee had just prepared to send Hood to guard the railroad when the withdrawal of Jackson from Cedar Run had still further increased his concern and had prompted him to dispatch Longstreet to Gordonsville. This had been followed by the discovery that McClellan was reducing force to strengthen Pope. Thereupon Lee concluded that he had to run a race to attack and destroy Pope before McClellan's troops could reach the new federal commander in northern Virginia. These events were not spectacular in themselves, but they are of interest to the student of war in two particulars, and first as an illustration of the manner in which sound military judgment must sometimes supplement the fullest information that can be procured of the movements of an adversary.
Li had more to do than interpret his intelligence reports, he had to read in them and through them the intentions of four separate forces, and on the validity of his conclusions he had to stake the safety of Richmond and the life of his army. Above all, he had to act with promptness. Delay, as so often happens, might mean disaster. How correct were his conclusions? To answer that question, in a case of so much complexity, is, at this period of his career, to take the measure of Lee as a strategist, in a very important respect. Lee had learned of Burnside's movement to Fredericksburg, it will be recalled, on August 5th or 6th. That officer had not landed there until the night of August 3rd and did not report all his troops ashore until August 9th. It was on August 13 that Lee was convinced that troops from Burnside's command were moving to reinforce Pope, the first troops to depart, King's Division, which had been at Fredericksburg before the arrival of Burnside, had actually left on August 910, and the major reinforcement, Reno with 12 regiments, started on the evening of August 12. As for McClellan, he had passed through a long controversy with the administration over the removal of his army from the James. Aside from his wounded, the first troops that he sent off were some batteries and 1,000 cavalry needed for Burnside, who had only a few mounted men. These left on August 11. Two days later Lee was informed that McClellan was reducing force. The news of the departure of Fitz John Porter's corps was received by Lee before Porter's column had crossed the Chickahominy on its march down the peninsula. As Lee took the train for Gordonsville, confident that he could safely diminish the troops guarding Richmond, McClellan's army was cooking rations for its departure from Harrison's Landing. Lee's record in interpreting the plan of his opponents thus speaks for itself. It is the more remarkable when one remembers that his intelligence service, at this time, was still crude. The transfer of Confederate units from James River to Gordonsville is the second point of interest in this period because it is an admirable example of the manner in which rapid troop movements could be conducted secretly during the war between the states. General King, at Fredericksburg, had heard a rumor of Jackson's departure from Richmond three days before the men were put on trains, and he had promptly reported it, but no attention had been paid to it. Not until July 16 had there been further intimation that Jackson's foot cavalry had left the James, and then, for a week, conflicting stories had circulated as to Jackson's whereabouts and strength. After it had become reasonably sure that Jackson and Ewell were in the vicinity of Gordonsville, the Federals had not been in agreement as to the size of the Confederate force in their front. Estimates ran from 15,000 to 80,000. Hill's arrival at Gordonsville had been unobserved and had occurred at a time when the Federals had been satisfied that the Virginia Central was operating irregularly, if at all. It was August 3rd before Pope was certain that Hill had joined Jackson. Longstreet arrived with equal secrecy. As late as August 20th, only when Lee was ready to launch his offensive, were the Federals satisfied that Longstreet was on the move. On the accuracy of his deductions, the secrecy of his troop movements and the confusion of his foes, Lee knew little when, on the morning of August 15, he took the cars for Gordonsville. It was the first time he had traveled on that railway since he had returned from West Virginia in November, 1861. What a change that brief period had wrought! Granny Lee, the butt of all the sarcasm of the street corner strategists, had become the king of spades to his grumbling trench-digging soldiers, and now, as the first captain of the Confederacy, the savior of Richmond, he was leaving a delivered capital with the confidence of the South. Daring marches, thrilling victories, and heartbreaking disappointments lay ahead, but the worn rails over which he was moving were to be, in a singular sense, a new frontier. South of the line of the Virginia Central, he was not to permit the main army of the enemy to pass again for twenty-one bloody months. Chapter 21, General Pope Retires Too Soon the little town of Gordonsville, where Lee arrived on August 15, is set in a lovely country that seemed in 1862 to invite great adventure. Then as now that section of Virginia was known as Piedmont, the foot of the mountains that rose in the lofty, tree-clad Blue Ridge. Westward, beyond the range, lay the Shenandoah Valley, already made famous in war by Jackson's battles. East of the mountains, which run roughly north and south, were long, low ridges, covered with grass or growing crops and broken here and there by rounded eminences, exalted with the name of mountains. Heavy forests were few. Swamps were rarely encountered along the clear-cut streams. The briar did not flourish.
There was little underbrush to cover skirmishers or to confuse an advancing column. Firmer roads ran closer to the surveyor's straight line than in eastern Virginia and were not as confusingly numerous. The possibilities of bold military operations were limited only by the scarcity of cover, which made it difficult to hide large bodies of troops for such strategy as Lee employed. Thanks to Jackson's forethought, when Lee sat down in council with him and Longstreet on the 15th, he had a good map and adequate intelligence reports. The Rapidan River on the south and the Rappahannock on the north form a great V laid on its side with its apex to the east, where the two rivers unite, about nine miles west of Fredericksburg. Across the open end of this V, at an average distance of 20 miles from the confluence of the streams, ran the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, which constituted Pope's line of supply. Into the angle between the two rivers, before Burnside had sent reinforcements, Pope had brought a force, which Jackson estimated at 45,000 to 50,000. Pope's front was to the Rapidan. Behind him lay the Rappahannock. 20,000 men, Lee estimated, had reached Pope from Burnside and from King, the latter being now first identified as in command at Fredericksburg before the coming of Burnside. These accessions, the Confederates computed, made Pope's full strength 65,000 to 70,000 men. No troops were coming down the railroad from Alexandria, escaped civilians said, but all the supplies of Pope's army were moving by that line and across a bridge that spanned the Northern River at Rappahannock Station. Pope's ignorance of Lee movements had caused him incautiously to present his adversary as fair an opportunity as ever a soldier was offered. If the infantry of the Army of Northern Virginia could be concentrated close to the Rapidan, the cavalry could be dispatched quickly to burn the bridge at Rappahannock Station, and then the veteran brigades from the peninsula could be hurled across the Rapidan. Pope would thus be caught within the V between the two rivers and might be destroyed. But this must be done quickly, for General French telegraphed on the morning of the 16th that 108 vessels had gone down the James in less than 24 hours and that only eight had come upstream. Moreover, Lee had received a copy of the Philadelphia Inquirer, in which its correspondent from Fort Monroe affirmed that a movement of the whole or a part of McClellan's army was to be expected. Adding these scraps to the information he already possessed, Lee concluded that the whole instead of merely a part of McClellan's army was probably, though not certainly, moving to reinforce Pope and that it would arrive as rapidly as the men could be transported. Both the stakes and the participants in the race might be even greater than Lee had assumed. It may be, he wrote the president on the 16th, that this part of the country is to be the scene of operations. The situation had sufficiently developed on the 15th for Lee to ask that our H. Anderson's division be sent forward immediately, a request that Davis honored with dispatch. On the 16th, Lee recommended that the rest of the troops left at Richmond, except the garrison and the reserve artillery, be ordered to join him, not only because he would need them but, also, as he diplomatically told the president, because their discipline would be improved if they were removed from the vicinity of the city. He could not wait for their arrival, however, if Mr. Davis consented to release them. He must strike while the opportunity was open and before Pope became alarmed and put the Rappahannock between him and Army of Northern Virginia. Forced to the utmost effort in June to prevent a federal concentration on Richmond, Lee must now be equally diligent to forestall a concentration away from Richmond. The only questions to be decided were when and on which flank the attack should be made. Longstreet was all for a movement by the Confederate left to give the army the vantage ground of the long ridges and high hills. Lee reasoned that it was sounder strategy to assail Pope's left so as to interpose between him and any fast-moving force from McClellan that might advance by way of Fredericksburg. And what was the earliest date at which the army could cross the Rapidan? Jackson, who had been in the country long enough to organize his transportation and to accumulate provisions, had moved on the 15th to Mount Pisgah Church, five miles northeast of Orange Courthouse. He advocated crossing the Rapidan on the 16th to give battle on the 17th. Some of Stonewall's admirers have affirmed that Longstreet insisted on having more time to provision his men, though Jackson offered to loan him enough hard bread for the march. This may be true, for Longstreet had moved to Gordonsville so hurriedly that his commissary doubtless was disorganized. If the claim be true, it should in fairness be remembered that Longstreet's only previous experience with Jackson's logistics had been during the seven days. At the conference of June 23, Jackson had announced that he would be in position to turn Beaver Dam Creek on June 25. 
At Longstreet's instance, the opening of the attack had been delayed until the 26th, and even then Jackson was late. Longstreet might readily have been forgiven if, after that experience, he argued for more time. Had Longstreet in the later case been both wrong in his estimate of Jackson and wrong in demanding delay for vittling his men, this could not have been the only reason why Lee did not order an advance on August 1617. The cavalry operation against Rappahannock Bridge was an essential part of Lee's plan, and the cavalry was not then concentrated and could not be by the night of the 16th, certainly not with the horses in condition to undertake a long and exacting raid. Later developments proved this all too clearly. The decision, then, was to approach the fords of the Rapidan on the 17th and to give battle to Pope on the 18th between the Rapidan and the Rappahannock. Orders to this effect were issued on the 16th, within approximately 30 hours after Lee reached Gordonsville. If busy Major E. P. Alexander of the Engineers knew of these orders and timed them, one is disposed to wonder if he remembered that ride with Colonel Ives, soon after Lee had assumed command, when he had somewhat skeptically asked Ives if Lee had the measure of audacity the necessities of the Southern cause demanded. From Gordonsville, Lee had changed his headquarters on the evening of the 15th to the plantation of Barton Haxel, and on the 16th he went to the Taylor Farm, near Orange Courthouse. There, on the 17th, though his information from the Richmond front was not very detailed, Lee concluded that McClellan's withdrawal involved the whole of McClellan's army, and from that time he gave himself no further immediate concern for the capital. His only comment to Mrs. Lee was, I suppose, McClellan, is coming here too, so we shall have a busy time. Through the adjutant general, he ordered General G. W. Smith to follow R. H. Anderson with another division, so that he would have ample troops for immediate operations, though he did not accept the camp estimate that Pope already had 92,000 men. Stuart reached Orange Courthouse by train on the afternoon of the 17th and came out to Lee's headquarters. He reported that he had moved Fitz Lee's brigade from Hanover Courthouse on the 16th to the vicinity of Beaver Dam and had left him there with orders to march on the 17th toward Raccoon Ford on the Rapidan, where Stuart expected to cross the river. Nothing was said that indicated any doubt in Stuart's mind concerning the arrival of Fitz Lee at the designated point that day. Hampton's cavalry brigade had been left on the Richmond front and could not possibly join the army in time to participate in the first stages of the new campaign. Fitz Lee's command, therefore, was all that Stuart had, except one battery of horse artillery, for the arduous task Lee had assigned him in dealing with the numerically superior Federal cavalry, which were showing vast improvement. To strengthen Stuart and to assure unified command of the cavalry, Lee now placed under Stuart's control the cavalry previously attached to Jackson, known as Robertson's Brigade. This created no friction, as Jackson had not been satisfied with the handling of his cavalry and had the highest opinion of Stuart. Preparations went on apace all day of the 17th. The army was in excellent spirits, confident of its ability to defeat Pope. There was no sign, as yet, that the Federals were aware of the thunderbolt Lee was forging for them. Everything pointed to an early and an overwhelming victory ere Pope could draw to him a single man of McClellan's hurrying thousands or seek refuge behind the high-banked Rappahannock. But when the morning of the 18th came, the army was not prepared. Anderson's division was arriving from Richmond and was not in position. There was no news from Stuart as to his whereabouts and none as to the arrival of Fitz Lee from Beaver Dam Station. The cavalry on the Confederate left was not disposed to suit Lee. The commissary did not have enough hard bread to serve for the move to the Rapidan for the march beyond it as well. Lee consequently had to defer the crossing of the river until the 19th. Even had all else been ready, Fitz Lee's cavalry would not have been at hand for its important work. For, as Lee learned later in the day, Stuart had been the victim of a curious misadventure that morning. Late in the afternoon of the 17th he had ridden 13 miles eastward from Orange to the little hamlet known as Verdiersville, where he expected Fitz Lee to halt for the night on his way to the rendezvous at Raccoon Ford. The quiet people of the slumbering countryside had answered with blank looks Stuart's questions regarding the location of the Confederate cavalry camp. They had seen no cavalry, they said. Much puzzled, Stuart had sent his assistant adjutant general, Major Norman Fitzhugh, down the road to find Fitz Lee and to hurry him on. Then Stuart and his aides had lain down on the porch of a private house to await the arrival of the belated troopers.
As day was breaking on the 18th Stuart saw a body of horsemen some 400 yards away and heard the clatter of advancing hoofs and the groaning of wheels. He asked Captain Mosby and Lieutenant Gibson to inquire if the column was Fitz Lee's. There was a moment's wait, loud voices, a shout of Yankee cavalry, a few nervous shots, and in an instant more Stuart was up, mounted, over a fence and dashing for the nearby woods, while his aides were scattered and galloping off with a federal patrol in avid pursuit. Fortunately, all the staff escaped except Major Fitzhugh, who had been captured while looking vainly for Fitz Lee and had been an unhappy spectator of his chief's hurried flight. The Federals rode triumphantly off with Stuart's hat and coat and left him wondering how they had stolen across the Rapidan. As he subsequently discovered, the explanation was simple, finding that Fitzlee had not arrived on the evening of the 17th, Longstreet had ordered two of his infantry regiments to guard the road from Raccoon Ford, but these men had been ordered away by their brigadier, General Robert Toombs, who had denied Longstreet's authority to move his men without his consent. A federal scouting party, finding the road open, had promptly moved southward and was returning when Stuart saw it. For permitting such a thing to happen, Toombs was promptly put under arrest, but that, of course, did not save Stuart's pride or restore his lost plumage. It probably was late in the morning of the 18th when the general-in-chief heard from Stuart of this mishap, and still later when he received a telegram from Fitzlee reporting where he was. Either because his orders had been carelessly drawn, or else because he had misinterpreted them, Fitzlee had not understood that he was to press on to Raccoon Ford by the evening of the 17th. If he had known that the opening of the attack depended on his arrival at that time, it is inconceivable that he would not have covered the 37 miles from Beaver Dam Station to the rendezvous. As it was, he had gone by way of Louisa Courthouse, where he had issued rations to his men and had replenished his ammunition. His telegram showed him still on the road with small prospect of reaching Raccoon Ford before the night of the 18th. Had he pushed ahead on the 17th, as Stuart had expected him to do, he would have had to cover 62 miles in two days. Now that he was behind schedule and was following a longer road, it was certain that his mounts would require a day's rest. So, regretfully, the commanding general was forced to postpone the crossing of the Rapidan one day more until the morning of the 20th. Stuart charged Fitzlee with dereliction of duty, and Longstreet, who had a postbellum controversy with him, insisted years afterwards that Fitzlee's failure to arrive at Raccoon Ford on the 17th lost the war to the South. But all early criticism of the young cavalryman curiously enough leaves out of account the fact that the commanding general had postponed the offensive before he heard that Fitzlee was late. The fault was one of organization rather than of an individual, and the delay in launching the offensive probably would have occurred even if the cavalry had arrived. The army had not yet learned the difficult art of a quick and sure coordination of all the arms of the service. Lee must have realized this. To his disappointment over his inability to strike Pope in his exposed position at the time he had appointed, there was added on the 18th a fear that the enemy had discovered his presence despite his efforts to conceal the army. He learned that the Federals at daylight had raided a single station that Jackson had established on a fine eminence known as Clark's Mountain, overlooking the valley of the Rapidan and the country northward toward the Rappahannock, where Pope had his camps. There was no way of telling what the enemy had seen before he had been driven back, or what records he had found. Before nightfall, the worst apprehension seemed realized in reports from the lookouts that the Federals were breaking up their camps and retiring toward Culpeper Courthouse, but the magnitude and meaning of this move were not wholly apparent then. Nor was there very definite news early on the morning of the 19th, Lee went ahead with his preparations. He had summoned the reserve artillery from Richmond on the 18th, and he now revised his orders for the advance on the 20th. In person he drafted new instructions for Stuart, whom he cautioned to rest his troops and to report how he was progressing in his concentration of the cavalry for the operations in rear of Culpeper Courthouse. The air, of course, was tense. The men knew that an advance was immediately in prospect. All private strategists of the camp messes were busily explaining what should be done to confound the foe. Before noon, the signal station announced another movement by the enemy. Without waiting for particulars, Lee sent for Longstreet and rode with him to the crest of the mountain. From its summit, wrote Longstreet, we had a fair view of many points, and the camp flags, as they opened their folds to the fitful breezes, seemed to mark places of rest. Changing our glasses to the right and left and rear, the white tops of army wagons were seen moving. 
Half an hour's close watch revealed that the move was for the Rappahannock River. Changing the field of view to the bivouacs, they seemed serenely quiet, under the cover of the noonday August sun. As we were there to learn from personal observation, our vigilance was prolonged until the wagons rolled down the declivities of the Rappahannock. Then, turning again to view the bivouacs, a stir was seen at all points. Little clouds of dust arose, which marked the tramp of soldiers, and these presently began to swell into dense columns along the rearward lines. Watching without comment till the clouds grew thinner and thinner as they approached the river and melted into the bright haze of the afternoon sun, General Lee finally put away his glasses, and with a deeply drawn breath, expressive at once of disappointment and resignation, said, General, we little thought that the enemy would turn his back upon us thus early in the campaign. It was all true, just as they had seen it. Unknown to Lee, a copy of one of his orders to Stuart, showing something of the whereabouts of the army, had been found on Major Fitzhugh when he had been captured, and this document had been sent to Pope. A spy, moreover, on the morning of August 18, had reported the Confederate preparations to General McDowell. General Reno had also discovered the Confederate dispositions. At 1.30 p.m. on the 18th Pope had started to withdraw from the trap in which he found himself. What Lee witnessed from Clark's Mountain was not the first but final phase of the retreat of the gentleman who had exhorted his soldiery to concern itself with the enemy's line of retreat and to leave its own to take care of itself. But whither was Pope withdrawing? As far as Lee could make out, he was moving by the road to Fredericksburg, but that road led into the narrow part of the V formed by the Rappahannock and Rapidan, where his condition would be worse than before. It was obvious that the Federals must intend to cross the Rappahannock and go northward. As the course of the Orange and Alexandria Railroad was from southwest to northeast beyond Culpeper, Pope could cross well down the Rappahannock and still not be at a dangerous distance from his communications. It was too late to begin pursuit on the afternoon of the 19th, and if the men started that night they would not be fresh for battle the next day. Lee consequently decided to give troops and horses a little rest and to cross the Rapidan at 4 a.m. with the rising of the moon. Stewart's proposed raid against Rappahannock Station would, of course, be futile if the enemy had already crossed the river, so his orders were amended, and he was instructed to sweep well to the eastward, covering Longstreet's right flank. Then he was to negotiate the Rappahannock at Kelly's Ford. Longstreet, in command of the right wing, was to cross the Rapidan at Raccoon Ford, where Lafayette once had met the waters of the Rapidan. Longstreet's objective was to be Culpeper Courthouse. Jackson, leading the left wing, was to pass over the river at Somerville Ford and was to move in the same direction. Anderson, following Jackson, was to form the general reserve. The rest, in Lee's mind, was with God and with circumstance. Chapter 22 By the Left Flank Up the Rappahannock in the dim light of a wasted moon, on the morning of August 20, 1862, the Army of Northern Virginia crossed the undefended fords of the Rapidan. Its seven divisions and two unattached brigades of infantry numbered about 50,000 men. The cavalry division and the artillery brought the total effectives to some 54,500. Lee had already asked that the divisions of D. H. Hill and McClaws be sent from Richmond to the North Anna River, near Hanover Junction, to guard against a reported federal movement in that direction. If these 17,000 troops were not detained there by the enemy, they might be counted as in three days' support of the main army on the Rapidan. There were no others nearer than Richmond. The known strength of the Federal horse and the uncertainty as to the movements of the enemy's infantry made it desirable, at the outset, to modify the orders for the employment of the Confederate cavalry. Fitz Lee was directed to cover the front and right flank of Longstreet's wing. Stuart went with Robertson in advance of Jackson. The detached regiment of Robertson's brigade remained on Jackson's left flank. Fitz Lee met with no opposition until he was close to Kelly's Ford on the Rappahannock. There he ran into the rear of the retiring Federals and had a brush. Stuart found the enemy cavalry in force between Stevensburg and Brandy Station and after some maneuvering drove them close to the Rappahannock where they had shelter under the fire of Federal batteries on the north side of the river. Two regiments of Fitz Lee's, summoned from Kelly's Ford, arrived promptly with Pelham's horse artillery to support Robertson, but not in time to prevent the passage of the river by the Federal troopers, unpunished. Following the cavalry, the infantry had an undisturbed march.
Longstreet ended the day with his advance guard close to Kelly's Ford and his rear five miles to the south. Jackson covered the distance from Somerville Ford to Stevensburg with his van not far from Brandy Station. Lee, moving with Jackson's column, established his headquarters and bivouacked for the night near Brandy. It was apparent to Lee that the whole of Pope's army was above the Rappahannock, with the fords heavily guarded. The ground on Lee's right was lower than that occupied by the Federals on the other side of the river. To effect a crossing without excessive losses, Lee had to move up the Rappahannock by his left flank. Fortunately, this did not appear to be a difficult operation because, while few bridges spanned the stream, the fords were numerous, easy, and close together. Accordingly, on the morning of the 21st, Robertson's brigade advanced up the right bank of the Rappahannock, crossed above Beverly Ford, and began to reconnoiter downstream on the left bank. Stewart proceeded to Beverly Ford, which was less than two miles above Rappahannock Bridge, and waited until the infantry arrived and joined him. Jackson put his rear division in front and set out from Brandy for the same ford, while Longstreet completed his movement to Kelly's ford and extended his left flank up the river to establish contact with Jackson's right. After Taliaferro's division of Jackson's command reached Beverly Ford it began a hot artillery action with federal batteries on the opposite bank. Under cover of this fire, Stuart moved over the river and made some minor captures. Robertson, coming down the left bank from higher up the river, got in touch with his chief and reported the enemy nearby in strength. This meant, of course, that the passage of the infantry was apt to be costly. Lee carefully examined the ground, weighed the chances of success, decided not to attempt a crossing, and recalled Stuart to the south bank. Longstreet was ordered to advance up the south bank of the Rappahannock from Kelly's Ford to Beverly Ford, a march that was started in the late afternoon, attended by a sharp and picturesque rearguard action with a federal force that ventured to the right bank of the river. The presence of the enemy near Beverly Ford did not mean that the turning movement up the Rappahannock was to be abandoned. On the contrary, Lee was more intent upon it than ever. From his imperfect information of the enemy's movements, he concluded that part of Pope's army was moving toward Fredericksburg and part toward Warrington, and he considered it desirable on every count to attack and dispose of the force nearest him. But the extension of his left flank up the Rappahannock would hourly carry Lee a greater distance from Richmond and might even put Pope between him and that city ere the Federals were flanked. Was this safe? Could the capital be held if he ventured farther into northern Virginia? The question, he felt, was one that should properly be referred to the president, so he telegraphed the facts and asked Davis's opinion. The answer came back promptly. The president said that he had not contemplated any lengthy offensive operations north of the Rappahannock and that he had no definite information of a retreat by McClellan beyond New Kent Courthouse. The two divisions en route to Hanover Junction must be held there to cooperate as needed, and the five brigades immediately in front of Richmond must be retained. This was not all that Lee could have desired. Still, the presence of two divisions at Hanover Junction would secure his communications. Moreover, the information of the War Department confirmed his belief that the whole of the Federal Army was leaving the peninsula. He would press up the Rappahannock, move his army over the first undisputed ford, and give battle. Stuart was to proceed ahead, cover the occupied fords, and permit Jackson to pass upstream with the infantry until he could effect a crossing. Longstreet was to follow. This operation to turn the flank of an enemy who might be expected to advance by parallel lines on the other side of the river was reduced to its simplest and safest form by considering the forces of Stuart, Jackson, and Longstreet as separate but cooperating units. In moving by the left flank up the Rappahannock, no commander was to leave any fort unguarded till the column next in rear had occupied ground opposite it. The enemy must not be allowed to cross the stream and get between the columns. Tactically, such an operation is familiar, but the opportunities it offers and the difficulties it involves were rarely so well illustrated as in this instance. Still another possibility was presented. The plan to break up Pope's communications by destroying the bridge at Rappahannock Station had been abandoned when the federal commander had retreated behind the river, but his railroad supply line was most temptingly exposed to a cavalry raid, for the Orange and Alexandria crossed several small streams on wooden spans that daring men might wreck, to the great discomfiture of General Pope. Stewart had proposed a raid to demolish the bridge at Catlett Station, and Lee now had this under advisement. 
he delayed a decision probably because he wished to see whether the developing situation imposed other compelling duty on the cavalry the next day. The news that came to headquarters on the morning of the 22d was not particularly encouraging. There was no word from the vicinity of the North Anna as to the arrival there of D. H. Hill or of McClaws, and no information concerning the whereabouts of the force that Lee was still of opinion Pope had detached from his left and had moved toward Fredericksburg. Nothing could be learned concerning the position of the van of McClellan's army, which must be hurrying at the utmost speed to join Pope. Worse still, the enemy seemed fully apprised of Lee's purpose to turn his right by outflanking him up the Rappahannock. When Stuart that day reached the next good crossing, Freeman's Ford, there were the Federals, strongly placed on the opposite bank as if defying the Confederates to force a passage. Jackson duly arrived and relieved Stuart but had to continue his march up the river, searching for an undefended crossing. The operation was becoming tedious. Wherever Lee moved, there was Pope, apparently confident and fully the master of the situation. Lee decided that something must be done to shake and demoralize the enemy. No means at Lee's disposal so readily promised this as the quick dash that Stuart had asked that he be permitted to make, with torch and carbine, against the Federal rear at Catlett Station. Orders to prepare for the raid were accordingly issued as soon as the situation at Freeman's Ford was disclosed. They reached Stuart while he was still engaged with the enemy opposite that crossing. To cover this ford, as he continued his march up the Rappahannock on the 22d, Jackson left Trimble's brigade behind him. Trimble had not been in position more than two hours when he learned, about noon, that the Federals had done what Lee had been careful to guard against. They had thrown a force across the river and were attacking the divisional wagon train. Trimble, an excellent soldier, beat off the enemy from the wagons, but finding that federal reinforcements had been brought up, he prudently decided to wait until the head of Longstreet's column arrived. When Hood's Texans and Lost Stout Brigade came on the ground, Trimble took the combined force and drove the Federals beyond the Rappahannock with some loss. Jackson, meantime, marched seven miles upstream on the afternoon of the 22d until he was opposite Warrenton's Sulphur Springs, a modest summer resort. The bridge across the river at this point had been burned, and there were signs that the Federals could not be far distant, but observation failed to show any bluecoats immediately at hand. Here, at last, was an opportunity to effect a passage unopposed, the opportunity the army had been seeking in its long march up the river. Jackson at once moved a regiment through the ford to hold the ground on the opposite side, and then he started Ewell's division across. Early's brigade and eight guns, using a dilapidated dam as a roadway, got safely over, but their passage was very slow. Before it had been completed, night fell and a heavy storm broke, such a storm as always means in the foothills of the Blue Ridge that streamlets will be torrents, creeks past fording, and every minor watershed an island. The passage of the Rappahannock had to be halted, and Mars had to await the pleasure of Jupiter Pluvius. On the left bank, General Early was soon cut off from the rest of Jackson's command. Longstreet, ad interim, had completed his withdrawal from Kelly's Ford and was concentrated around Rappahannock Station, with his left advance to Freeman's Ford. The rainy night of the 22d settled, then, in unrelieved blackness on a situation that was still unpromising. Stuart had started off on a raid against Catlett Station with all except two regiments of the cavalry. Jackson, at Warrenton Springs Ford, had eight small regiments and two batteries, under Early, cut off by the raging Rappahannock. Longstreet and Anderson, downstream, were facing superior artillery. All that was known of Pope was that he was conforming to the Confederate left flank movement and was holding, or else was close, to all the fords the army had tried. During the night it was reported, also, that a force had recrossed to the south side of the river at Rappahannock Bridge. Manifestly, if the enemy was strong in front of Early on the left bank of the river, the flank movement had to be extended farther up the Rappahannock, but this would depend on developments at Warrenton Spring Ford. On the evening of the 22d, nothing definite could be planned for the next day beyond a strong artillery demonstration at Rappahannock Bridge for the double purpose of driving back the Federals at that point and of creating the impression, if possible, that the Confederates intended crossing there. At dawn on the 23d of August, as Longstreet's artillery was brought up to demonstrate at Rappahannock Station, a heavy mist overhung the river. When this lifted, the batteries opened.
a small force of Federals that was found to hold a little redoubt on the south side of the river was promptly forced to seek the North Band and the opposing Federal guns were silenced. While Longstreet was making this demonstration, Jackson was trying to rebuild the burned bridge at Warrenton Springs Ford and was instructing Early regarding the defense he was to make in his threatened position. If attacked heavily before the bridge was finished, Early was to retreat up the left bank of the Rappahannock and cross where he could. Luckily, the hours passed without an assault on Early, but before the anxious days ended, word was passed back to Lee that the Federals seemed to be massing opposite the ford. This seemed a reasonable probability, because Pope naturally would conclude that the high water lower down the river would keep the Confederates from turning his left and for that reason would hasten to strengthen his right. As a countermove, Lee directed that Longstreet waste no more time and powder at Rappahannock Bridge, but join Jackson forthwith. Much more important than these happenings of the 23D was the news from Stuart. After receiving his orders on the 22D, that officer had ridden to Catlett's station in the blackness of what he described as the darkest night he had ever seen. A friendly Negro had guided him to Pope's headquarters, which happened to be nearby. The commander of the Army of Virginia had been absent at the time, but his uniform coat had been in his tent, and several of his staff had been there, including Lee's nephew, Louis Marshall. A miscellaneous mass of Pope's military papers, including a dispatch book, had been carelessly placed where the Confederates could seize them. They had been gathered up and brought off, together with General Pope's quartermaster, who had subsequently done some indiscreet talking. The railroad bridge had been too wet to burn and too heavy to cut down in the darkness, but failure in that particular was quite forgotten when the nature of the captured correspondence was discovered. Lee's first information of all this merely covered what Stuart had accomplished and what the captured quartermaster had said. This loquacious officer affirmed that Cox's army in western Virginia had been ordered to move to Wheeling and then to join Pope. Without waiting for the arrival of Pope's papers, Lee advised the War Department of this news and urged that General Loring's little force, which had been watching Cox, should be sent to cut the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, against which he had already dispatched a small cavalry column from the Appalachian District. Late on the 23d or early in the morning of the 24th, Lee received a few of the more important of Pope's papers. From these he discovered that Pope had 45,000 men on August 20, exclusive of the reinforcements from Burnside, and that he had not detached any of these eastward toward Fredericksburg, as Lee had thought on the 21st, Pope's expectation, he read, was to hold the line of the Rappahannock until McClellan could join him from the vicinity of Fredericksburg. This movement, Lee found, was already underway, and Porter's Corps, the advanced unit of McClellan's army, was to march from the vicinity of Fredericksburg to Pope's left flank. The reading of the dispatches containing this information showed that the race between Lee and McClellan to reach Pope was getting dangerously close. That knowledge was the turning point of the campaign. All that followed, until the Second Battle of Manassas, was based upon what Lee learned at this time of his adversary's plans and numbers. His first reaction was one of wariness. He now knew, as he had already suspected, that Pope was numerically superior to him, besides having a great advantage in artillery. As soon as McClellan's divisions joined Pope, the odds against the Army of Northern Virginia would be hopeless, even if the conclusive evidence of McClellan's withdrawal from Richmond made Mr. Davis willing to strip the defenses of the capital and to send Lee all the units still around the city. If, luckily, a part of Pope's army could be caught, it would of course be attacked, but an offensive leading to a battle between the whole of the two armies would entail losses to the Confederates that could not then be replaced, even if a victory were gained. A general engagement was therefore to be avoided. What, then, could Lee do? Obviously, he could ask Davis to forward the troops on the North Anna and those around Richmond, and thus reduce the disparity of forces. But beyond that, what? Should he retire, should he advance, or should he remain where he was? He had reached a part of Virginia from which the Federals previously had been drawing supplies. If he remained there he could subsist his men on supplies the Federals would otherwise devour, and to that extent he would be saving the rest of the South from a drain on its resources. It was desirable, then, to remain north of the Rappahannock and, if possible, to go still farther into the territory occupied by the enemy. But, once again, how? There was only one way, and that was to continue maneuvering. 
Every mile that he could lead Pope away from Fredericksburg was another mile to be covered by the units from McClellan before they could form a junction with Pope. Every square mile that could be cleared of Federals before it was cleared of provisions meant to the Confederacy so many more bushels of grain and so many pounds of bacon that, by any other military policy, most certainly would feed the enemy. If the proper course was to avoid a general engagement and to force Pope away from McClellan and out of the fat agricultural districts of northern Virginia, what form of maneuver would accomplish the largest result in the shortest time? As Lee looked at his map for the answer, he of course fixed his eye on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. He had hoped to cut that supply line at Rappahannock Bridge, but had been thwarted by Pope's swift retreat, he had essayed it with Stewart's cavalry at Catlett Station but had been balked by the rain that had wet the timbers of the bridge. He would try again at a greater distance to ensure a larger success and a longer retreat. In doing so, he might be able to put part of his army between Pope and Washington. Once before, when he had been anxious to keep McDowell from joining McClellan, he had sent Jackson to the Potomac after the battles of Cross Keys and Port Republic and had found the Federals quick to rush troops to defend their capital. It was worthwhile to try the same strategy now. If it failed, he would still be close to the mountains and, if need be, could enter the Shenandoah Valley, which led to the Upper Potomac. And the Potomac was the lane to the back door of Washington. This, then, was the course dictated by a reading of the dispatches that General Pope's clerks had patiently copied into his dispatch book, with little thought that they were preparing an intelligence report for General Lee, a general engagement with a stronger adversary army was to be avoided, because the losses could not be replaced, instead, there must be maneuver to lengthen the distance between Pope and McClellan and to feed the Confederates in territory the enemy otherwise would strip. This maneuver must be undertaken with one eye to cutting Pope's railroad, and with the other eye on Washington. And now to the details, during the early morning of August 24, Early returned to the right bank of the Rappahannock, without loss, over the bridge that Jackson had reconstructed at Warrenton Springs Ford. The Federals were beginning to appear in great strength on the opposite side, as if anticipating an attempt by the Confederates to cross there. At P. Hill's artillery was massed to confront them but held its fire until the Union infantry appeared, about noon. Then it opened and broke up the deployment. Lee now wrote Davis of his discoveries from Pope's correspondence and tactfully ordered the remaining units of the Army of Northern Virginia to rejoin him. He added that if the president did not approve of this, he could countermand it. Then, while Hill's guns were roaring, Lee sent for Jackson to come to his headquarters, which had now been moved to the quiet little village of Jeffersonton. The conference that followed between the two was one of the most important Lee ever held. Briefly he told Jackson that he wished him to take his command, to march up the Rappahannock, to get in rear of Pope's army, and to cut his communications with Washington. There is no evidence that he mentioned Manassas Junction as the point at which the road was to be cut, and it is more than likely that he left the specific objective and the line of advance to Jackson. Jackson was much excited at the prospect, and as he and Lee stood together, he drew with his boot on the ground a rough diagram of the maneuver. Lee, listening, nodded approval. Why did Lee choose Jackson for this movement, after Jackson's failure in front of Richmond? The explanation is simple. Jackson was now a very different person from the exhausted general of the seven days. He was conveniently on the left, he knew the country, he shone best on detached service, his men were inured to long, fast marches in just such country as that which they were to traverse. These considerations, or some of them, doubtless account for Lee's choice. Jackson would carry with him in his three divisions, Taliaferro's, Ewell's, and A. P. Hill's, approximately 23,000 men. That would leave Lee only some 32,000 until the arrival of the reinforcements the president might forward from the North Anna and from the Richmond Front. Such a division of force in the face of an enemy of known superior strength, apt to be reinforced at any time, was, of course, a violation of the strategic canon of concentration in the face of the enemy. Lee deliberately violated that canon in this instance. He did not do so because of contempt for Pope, as has been alleged, for the truth was that after the initial blunder of placing himself between the Rapidan and the Rappahannock, Pope had made no mistake. On the contrary, his dispositions had been prompt and soldier-like and had offered Lee no opening. The reason for Lee's division of force has already been given.
it was that an attack on Pope's line of communication seemed to be the only means of maneuvering into a retreat an opponent whom he did not feel strong enough to fight. Had he any intention to give battle, it is unlikely that Lee would have adopted such a dangerous course. Even as it was, he did not intend that Longstreet should be separated from Jackson longer than was necessary to mask Jackson's advance. Years afterwards, when told that his move had been criticized as over-rash, he said, such criticism is obvious, but the disparity between the contending forces rendered the risks unavoidable. The orders for the afternoon of August 24 and for the 25th were, then, as follows. 1. A. P. Hill to continue his demonstration at Warrenton Springs Ford until dark on the 24th. 2. Longstreet to replace A. P. Hill after nightfall and to cover the Rappahannock as far as Waterloo Bridge, for miles above Warrenton Springs Ford. 3. Jackson to move at dawn on the 25th, with three divisions in light marching order, carrying only his ordnance train and ambulances, and a herd of cattle for subsistence, to cross the Rappahannock above Waterloo Bridge, in order to cut Pope's communications via the Orange and Alexandria Railroad and thereby to put himself between Pope's army and Washington. 4. Stewart to continue on reconnaissance to guard Waterloo Bridge until relieved, and to make ready to follow and to support Jackson upon receipt of orders. Jackson's men received the familiar instructions to prepare three days' cooked rations, the usual preliminary to a hard march, and after Hill's artillery fire died away, they gossiped over their campfires about their probable movements, but on neither side of the now-subdued Rappahannock, flowing calmly within peaceful banks, was there an intimation of the tremendous events that were to follow Jackson's departure with the dawn. Chapter 23 Great News Comes on a Hard March Longstreet's van relieved A.P. Hill after nightfall on the 24th, and the rest of his gray regiments came over the green hills opposite Warrenton Springs Ford while the last of Jackson's foot cavalry filed off about daybreak on August 25. The Federals were still in position on the other side of the Rappahannock and were known to have extended their right flank far upstream because Stuart's sharpshooters had been forced road to ram and fire fast the previous day to keep the enemy from crossing at Waterloo Bridge. All the morning and most of the afternoon of the 25th the artillery exchanged its challenge across the river, but the demonstrations ended in smoke and sound. The infantry were not engaged. Lee had time for study of his situation and for his correspondence. Pope's defiant strength led him to suspect that part of McClellan's army had come up, so he hurried off a courier to Rapidan Station with a telegram for the president. This set forth his views and urged speed in the dispatch of the reinforcements of whose advance he had heard little. General Gilmer was directed by letter to hasten the completion of the Richmond defenses so that still more troops could be withdrawn from them, and the Secretary of War was asked to locate and to send forward a regiment of cavalry reported idle in North Carolina. Cavalry is very much needed in this region, Lee told General Randolph, the service is hard and the enemy strong in that arm. In the evening, General Stewart rode over to headquarters at Jeffersonton to report and to get his orders. Lee gave him detailed instructions for his march in support of Jackson, and in the knowledge that Jackson's operation required an abundance of cavalry, Lee authorized Stewart to take all his troopers with him, an overgenerous act for which he was soon to pay. The day ended with a visit from Rooney. Lee had not seen him for some time and had heard little from his family since he had left Richmond. Rooney told his father of his adventures with Stuart, a tale that stirred the heart of the whilom colonel of the 2D United States Cavalry. At first opportunity, he wrote Charlotte about the pleasant moments with his son and could not forbear expressing a measure of pride over Rooney's part in the raid on Catlett Station. He is very well, he told her, and the picture of health. In the recent expedition, he led his regiment, during a terrible storm at night, right through the camp of the enemy, capturing several hundred prisoners and some valuable papers of General Pope. I am so grateful to Almighty God for preserving, guiding, and directing him in this war, help me pray to him for the continuance of his signal favor. There was something suspicious about the movements of the enemy the next morning, August 26. The bridgehead was still occupied and the fire was strong, but the bustle was not that of a foe expecting to receive or intending to deliver an attack. Soon Lee interpreted what was happening across the river as an indication that the enemy was beginning to move away. Did this mean that Pope had discovered that Jackson had left, and was he hurrying to protect his rear and to crush the foot cavalry while Lee's forces were divided? Lee could not answer the question, but he did not hesitate over his dispositions.
If Pope was moving away from the Rappahannock, he would soon be within striking distance of Jackson, even if he had not already had wind of the March of Stonewall. The Army of Northern Virginia must, therefore, be reunited. Calling to him the stocky, hard-headed Longstreet, who was already known to his men as Old Pete, Lee told him he intended to join Jackson as soon as possible. Would Longstreet prefer to force the crossings of the Rappahannock and take the shorter route, or did he think it better to follow the longer but safer road that Jackson had chosen? Longstreet deliberated and then announced that as there were several strong positions where Pope could oppose him between the Rappahannock and Warrington, he would rather advance as Jackson had done, via Orleans and Salem. Orders were issued accordingly. R. H. Anderson was told to cover Warrington Springs Ford, and the right wing, that was soon to be the famous First Corps, stole quietly away during the afternoon under cover of the hills and headed north. Passing over a branch of the Rappahannock at Henson's Mill, it covered eleven honest miles before it bivouacked for the night. Everywhere, as it marched on, the country people doubtless told how Jackson's column had passed the day before, swinging fast in the cool of the morning, while Jackson grimly urged them on with the oft-repeated words, close up, men, close up. As Lee and his mess were preparing to eat their meager evening meal by the roadside near Orleans, an invitation, as pressing as gracious, came for the general and his staff and Longstreet and his military household to have supper at nearby home of the marshals. Lee was careful never to stay at private homes in a country where the subsequent appearance of the enemy might bring embarrassment to his hosts or provoke reprisals on them, but in this instance, as it seemed unlikely that the Federals would soon return, he accepted. A glorious meal in the lavish Virginia style was followed by a pleasant evening of social conversation, during which even Longstreet unbent. Before retiring, Lee told Mrs. Marshall that his party would have to start so early the next morning that he could not possibly accept her invitation to breakfast. The hostess, however, was not to be outdone in courtesy, and at dawn a bountiful breakfast was announced. Not knowing when or where they again would taste such cookery, the staff ate heartily, and with many thanks rode off, blessing the honored name of Marshall. At the head of the long, long, column, which was marching doggedly on at the root step, Lee and his officers on the morning of August 27 covered the ten miles to the vicinity of the little village of Salem, now known as Marshall. There a halt was made for a short rest. Hungry and thirsty soldiers in the leading regiments walked ahead to see if the stores and wells offered refreshment. Soon a quartermaster came dashing back down the road, crying loudly, The Federal Cavalry are upon us and on his heels galloped a bluecoat squadron. Only his staff and a few couriers were with Lee, who was directly in the line of the advancing troops. Holsters were unstrapped with nervous fingers, swords were bared, the little cavalcade spread itself across the road, determined at any price to delay the enemy until the general could make off. An anxious half-minute passed, then the Federals halted, looked for an instant, mistook the mounted men for a strong cavalry column, and retired as they had come. It was the first close escape Lee had experienced since that day in western Virginia when a detachment of Union cavalry had swept past without seeing him in the woods. Who were the Federals, and what did their presence signify? Lee had no cavalry to whom he could look for an answer. The whole column had to wait until the neighbors could be questioned as to the direction from which the bluecoats had come and the numbers they had displayed. The conclusion was that they had moved from the vicinity of Warrington and that they were not strong enough to threaten the column, but time was lost, valuable time, in trying to ascertain what a regiment of cavalry could have established in half an hour. So much for the mistake in detaching the whole of the cavalry to help Jackson. Even when the army at length moved forward again, the men on the lookout for the Federals unconsciously slowed their pace. The only tangible evidence of enemy depredation found by the advanced files was of a singular sort. Directly in the middle of the road on which Longstreet was moving stood a deserted family carriage, its horses gone and its occupants fled. When Lee rode up and inquired about this odd spectacle, he was told that the owner, a lady of the neighborhood, had taken refuge in a nearby house with her daughters. Characteristically, he cantered over to ascertain what had happened. He learned from the matron's regretful lips that she had heard of his approach and had ridden out with her daughters to see him. On the way the Federals had overtaken them and, deaf to the lady's remonstrances, had unceremoniously taken her span of bay horses and had gone off with them. Lee administered such comfort of words as he could and expressed his regret that he could not replace the lost team.
The lady was pleased at his civilities and felt that she had at least accomplished the object of her errand, but she was compelled to admit thereafter that two matched carriage horses were a rather heavy price to pay, even for a chat with General Lee. The march continued in sickening heat and stifling dust. The road was so narrow that the column was strung out for miles, and water was so scarce that the thirst men drank dry the stagnant mud holes. It was in vain that Lee, to save them from exhaustion, asked if there were no other, shorter roads his men might follow. Two and a half miles from Salem the weariness of the march was broken by the arrival of a courier. He had come over the Bull Run Mountains, and he brought from Jackson a dispatch that made every heart beat faster. By an astounding two days march Jackson had covered fifty-four miles, and the previous evening had reached Bristow Station. There he had captured two trains, though two had escaped. Then, while some of their men had been tearing up the track, Trimble with two regiments and Stuart with part of the cavalry had gone seven miles farther up the Orange and Alexandria Railroad to Manassas Junction, where Jackson had heard that the Federals had accumulated vast stores. The junction had been taken with slight opposition, and all its treasures were the Confederates. The dispatch modestly announced the occupation of Bristow and Manassas, but the army instantly acclaimed the operation one of the greatest feats of the war. Jackson was precisely where Lee wanted him to be, in rear of the Federal Army and between it and Washington. Not only so, but at the time Jackson had written, there had been little evidence that the Federals were massing to meet him. With good fortune, the two wings of the army could unite again before Pope's retreat, which was now inevitable, brought him in superior force to Manassas. Lee saw possibilities of high maneuvers from Jackson's position if more men were forthcoming, and in customary manner he wrote of the next move as he read of the last. In a dispatch to the president, conveying the good news, he urged once again that reinforcements, particularly Hampton's cavalry brigade, be sent forward with all speed. Somewhere on the way, the messenger that carried his dispatch to the telegraph station at Rapidan probably passed a courier bound from that place with a message from Davis. In this, the president told Lee of the advance of the troops already sent to his assistance. With a mind to the criticism that would certainly overwhelm him if Richmond were taken because it was stripped of its defenders, the president concluded, confidence in you overcomes the view which would otherwise be taken of the exposed condition of Richmond and the troops retained for the defense of the capital are surrendered to you on a new request. Reinforcements coming, Jackson between Pope and Washington, the railroad cut, the enemy's advanced base destroyed, it was enough to strengthen men to endure even the torture of that endless days groping through dust that burned eyes and parched throats. Yet, though the troops marched cheerfully, there was a definite lessening of tension, and the pace was slower. Lee did not have the heart to push the men when there was nothing in Jackson's dispatch to indicate that his situation demanded a forced march. Headquarters were established late in the evening at the home of James W. Foster, near White Plains. Some of the rear units kept the road until 2 a.m. and then lay down where they halted. Even then the stinted rest of exhausted bodies was broken when an old gray mare belonging to one of the Texas regiments dashed frantically through the sleeping ranks. Someone gave the alarm, General Hood subsequently wrote, crying with a loud voice, look out, and the brave men who had fought so nobly at Cold Harbor sprang to their feet, deserted their colors and guns, and ran down the slope over a well-constructed fence, which was soon leveled to the ground, and had continued their flight several hundred yards before they awoke sufficiently to recover their wits, and boldly marched back convulsed with laughter. Lee was now on the watershed of the Potomac, the dividing line between the Union and the Confederacy. If Jackson was still at Manassas, the remainder of the Army of Northern Virginia, on the morning of August 28, was just 22 miles from him, a long but not an impossible day's march. There was only one natural obstacle in the way, thoroughfare gap. The road from the plains led up Bull Run Mountains to this pass, paralleling the Manassas Gap Railroad and a little stream that flows finally into Occoquan Creek. The gap itself was not so formidable as its name implied, nor so much of a cannon as some writers have represented it to be. With good tactics it could be wrested from a small opposing force, but if the enemy by any evil chance of war held the gap in strength, there would be trouble. At the moment there seemed little prospect of this. All the news was reassuring. Couriers arrived at intervals during the morning from Jackson, passing unhindered through the gap. 
they brought the cheering and important tidings that Jackson had left the exposed position at Manassas and was resting his men, undisturbed and apparently unobserved, at a place called Groveton, seven miles northwest of Manassas. This move put him 19 miles from Lee and not 22, as had been supposed. Confidently, then, the tired soldiers rose on the morning of August 28 from their short night's broken slumber and moved through a beautiful country toward Thoroughfare Gap. The highest ground was reached before the gap was visible and the downgrade began, but the progress of the wagon train was slow and the day was hot, despite the elevation. The morning had dragged to noon and the noon to 3 p.m. before the head of the column approached the gap. Lee was disposed to call a halt and give the men twelve hours sleep so that they would be fresh the next morning to descend the Bull Run Mountains and to join with Jackson in a new maneuver that would throw Pope back on Washington. As a precaution, however, Lee determined to send forward Longstreet's leading division, that of D. R. Jones, to occupy the pass against possible seizure by the Federals, who by this time might be close at hand. Jones went briskly forward, with G. T. Anderson's brigade of Georgians in the field. Soon from the echoing sides of the defile, there rolled the sound of an angry fire. Presently the message of all messages that Lee least wished to hear was glumly brought back, the enemy in undetermined strength held the pass and commanded it from a ridge at the opposite side. Jackson had been interposed between the Federals and Washington, now the Federals stood squarely between the two wings of the Army of Northern Virginia. Bad news, indeed. For if the Union force in the mountains was large enough and stubborn enough, Longstreet could be held off while the rest of Pope's army demolished Jackson. Then the united force of Pope and McClellan could fall upon Longstreet. So reasoned the strategists in the ranks and some of those in command, as the report swept swiftly rearward. But if Lee shared these fears, he gave no outward sign. Quietly, he rode forward to the summit of the hill west of the pass and there he dismounted. Slowly and without a tremor he put his glasses to his eyes and studied the gap closely. Then he calmly put his binocular back into the case, returned to his mount and went back down the hill. Perhaps he knew enough of Jackson's position to realize that if Stonewall learned that Longstreet was in difficulties, he could skirt the northern end of the Bull Run Mountains and join him. Perhaps, again, Lee's quick eye for topography and his experience in Mexico and western Virginia convinced him that Thoroughfare Gap was not so formidable as it was reputed to be, that there must be trails or minor passes by which resolute men could turn the position of the enemy. He gave his orders briskly, D. R. Jones was to press the enemy on either side of the gap. Hood's division was to search for a nearby route over the mountain, and Wilcox, temporarily commanding three brigades, was to move them quickly to the northward and to try Hopewell Gap, three miles to the left. While these dispositions were being made, Lee went to dine at the nearby Robinson home, the hospitable owner of which pressed an invitation on him and his staff, and this meal, wrote an officer who had a good memory for gustatory delights, was partaken of with as good an appetite and as much geniality of manner as if the occasion was an ordinary one, not a moment in which victory or ruin hung trembling in the balance. It must have been about the timely finished dinner, in the late afternoon, that the troops who were climbing and crawling over the barren rock and through the tangled mountain laurel heard in the intervals between the slow federal artillery fire a low and ominous mutter far from the eastward, gunfire, artillery, a battle doubtless in progress in the distance. It must be Jackson, found and assailed by the enemy who might, ere this, have been joined by some of those hard-hitting volunteers from the Army of the Potomac. It seemed a critical hour. At the gap, the Federals now pushed forward their artillery and swept the defile. Jones put one brigade on the cliffs to the left, and another, with two regiments of a third, to the right. Two regiments were held in reserve. As Jones could not bring his batteries to bear, his unprotected men had to force their way from rock to rock, firing as they came closer to the Federals. Finally, one of Jones's regiments, the 1st Georgia Regulars, got within effective range. It made its fire count. An attempt by the enemy to hurl back the Georgians was quickly repulsed. Twilight began to fall in the pass, but the fire continued, as if the Federals, in confident possession of a dominating position, were determined to hold off the Confederates until Jackson was finished. The situation gave every promise of a long, ugly fight. Law's brigade, however, had been sent a little farther to the left by General Hood, under the guidance of a man who professed to know a trail.
When the end of this was reached, Law found a cleft in the rock through which his men could go forward, one at a time. Ere long, his skirmish line was formed on the crest, and as it descended, Law breathed an immense relief, for, looking down, he could see that he was beyond the flank of the Federals facing the gap. Resolution, speed, and good tactics might drive the enemy, even if only that one brigade could be thrown against him. Quickly Law's line was formed to turn the enemy's batteries, anxiously the men started forward. Before they got in range, the Union batteries limbered up and dashed to the rear. Law was for pushing on, and he frothed with rage a few minutes later when peremptory orders came for him to retire. Most unwillingly his men returned as they had come, tramping in the half-darkness over the dangerous ground. But the threat of the advancing Confederates had already had its effect, and there was no reason for exposing the brigade. The enemy was preparing to retreat. Jones waited a while and then boldly marched his division unopposed through the pass. Wilcox, hurrying to Hopewell Gap, found evidence that the Federals had been there during the day, but they had left at nightfall, and by 10 p.m. he started on his unmolested march to the eastern face of the mountains. When the anxious day ended, the danger was passed, as if by some miracle. Lee sent a courier to Jackson, announcing the outcome of the fight at the Gap, and two stout divisions of the Army of Northern Virginia slept on their arms with their faces towards Stonewall's battleground. Since the forenoon they had heard nothing directly from him, except the growl of his guns, which had continued until 9 p.m. But there was hope in their hearts. Only the open road lay before them now, and they were determined that all the might that Pope could muster should not halt them on the morrow.